Ainsley. Bride's Dock on Portum Island, Book 5. By Debbie Civil. Narrated by Ishkia Page. Prologue. Cassandra Hall stared at the four women who sat in plastic chairs in front of her desk. She took in deep breaths, concerned with how her news would go over. Esperanza caressed her baby bump, a soft smile on her face. Tessa and Julia weren't as pregnant as Esperanza, but their glows were just as bright. Liz sat there, a fierce expression on her face. She wasn't currently with child, but Cassandra got the impression that she liked it that way. Four success stories later, and the council still insisted that she needed to tweak her business model. Thank you for coming, ladies. I promise this will be quick. Tessa, a beautiful redhead, fidgeted. I seriously have to pee. Can you get on with it? Okay, let's do it. I'd like each of you to mentor a mail-order bride, Cassandra announced. Esperanza appeared resigned, while Julia and Tessa seemed interested. Liz was another story. You want us to babysit mail-order brides? Councilman Terez wants to punish me. For that reason alone, I won't do it. Sorry, Cassie. I'm standing my ground. If Mary Blackhawk isn't punished for framing me, I won't follow the council's orders. You'll be waiting a long time for justice, Liz, Tessa chimed in. And is that all right? We're just going to sit here while the evil woman manipulates people into doing what she wants them to do? Pretty much, Tessa replied. It isn't like we have much of a choice. We're outsiders. Julia said, and her words broke Cassandra's heart. Her goal was to integrate her brides into the Portum Island community. As long as we go with the flow, they'll leave us be, Esperanza tiredly said. Ladies, we should fight for equality. We should walk up to the council and tell them that they need to enforce their laws. I was framed, and Mary Blackhawk is walking around with no criminal record. According to Thomas, her entire staff quit. All cleaning services on the island have refused to clean her house, and most of the common folk ignore her. That's the best you're going to get, Liz. Tessa's words didn't soothe Liz. She deserves a day in jail for what she did to me. That's how long I had to spend there. Liz had a point, but Cassandra doubted that a black hawk would willingly agree to her terms. You saved Marcus's business. You started a revolution. Isn't that enough? Tessa asked. Liz, just do it. If you don't, that bride will be vulnerable to Mary Blackhawk, Julia pointed out. Liz sighed. I'll do it, but I hope you know that I'll encourage my bride to stand up for herself. She won't be weak, pathetic. She'll be strong. Liz got to her feet, waved at the group, and hurried out of the room. Tessa let out a groan. The last time she was filled with determination, I got blisters from a ten-mile walk. I'm sure whatever she has planned will be tame, Esperanza said through a yawn. Yeah, right. Cassandra, give me some fun. I'd prefer someone I can drink with. Our house is a dry one, and I'd love a good margarita. You're pregnant, Tessa, Julia gently reminded her best friend. Tessa dramatically smacked her forehead. Right, I forgot. Seriously, I know I'm pregnant, Julia. I'm sort of hoping that Cassandra sticks me with a bride after I give birth. I would like a bride that loves children, Julia decided. Cassandra wasn't a genie, but she'd do what she could. Esperanza, what about you? She might as well ask. I'd like someone easy to deal with. Damn, I should have thought of that, Tessa muttered to herself. I'll do my best, but I can't make any promises, Cassandra said. Chapter One Hon, can you please send this back? I asked for grilled cheddar cheese. You gave me American. Also, can you tell the cook to use a little less salt in the tomato soup? 
Ainsley Smith, an overworked waitress, was tempted to dump the plate of food over Shelley Anderson's head. It wasn't enough that the huzzy stole her boyfriend. She harassed Ainsley every chance she got. Shelley, this is the third plate of food you sent back, Ainsley said in a sickly sweet tone. You don't expect me to pay for something I don't want, do you? Shelley straightened and put her shoulders back, giving Ainsley a perfect view of the necklace that she wore around her neck. The heart-shaped beauty hung on a thin, delicate chain. It was the same one that Patrick had given Ainsley for their three-year anniversary. After her ex decided that he wanted another woman living in his apartment, he had packed up her belongings, minus the jewelry. Now she knew why. She was about to reach for the plate when a hand knocked hers away. Ainsley stiffened when she noticed her identical twin Presley standing to her left. Her normal girly twin was wearing an oversized blue t-shirt and leggings and chucks, which was confusing. Presley enjoyed wearing tight girly clothing that displayed her curves. What was this world coming to? Pre- "'What are you doing here?' Ainsley asked. "'Oh, come on! Didn't you miss me, sis?' Since they lived together, the answer was a resounding no. Ainsley's heart nearly fell out of her chest when Presley fished out an iPhone out of her purse and fiddled with it. A chorus of dings immediately came from the phones at the table. Presley grinned maniacally, then snatched up the sandwich on Shelley's plate and took a big bite. Shelley rolled her eyes and tapped on her phone. There was an awkward moment where everyone was engrossed in their phones. Ainsley mourned the phone that Patrick forced her to return. The smartphone had been a gift for Christmas. Shelley slammed down her phone and looked at Ainsley with hatred. You desperate cow! Shelley shouted before tossing the contents of her Shirley Temple into Ainsley's face. The waitress jerked back, surprised by the move, shivering from the cold liquid hitting her body. What the hell is your problem? Ainsley snapped at her unwelcome customer. Since the third grade, Shelley Anderson went out of her way to be cruel to Ainsley. I don't like skanks, Shelley replied. Please not again. Ainsley pleaded to the universe. My sister isn't a skank. You're the one that broke girl code and went after another woman's property, Presley said. Maybe your sister wasn't exciting enough for him. Didn't you think about that? Maybe you're not exciting enough for him. Patrick wanted her back. Believe me, it didn't take any convincing for him to consider making things work with Ainsley. Hope and anger hit Ainsley all at once. There was a chance that Patrick could take her back and her life would be stable again. But the anger soon crushed her hope. So after tossing her to the curb, Patrick thought that being with her was still on the table? What can I say? Patrick loves predictability. Why don't you just leave, Shelley? Ainsley demanded. Shelley got to her feet and flipped Ainsley the bird. That was apparently too much for Pre. Her twin dove for Shelley and yanked her out of the booth. Presley, stop, Ainsley begged. Presley ignored her and delivered a punch that caused blood to pour down Shelley's nose. The other women at the table, being the loyal creatures they were, began filming the fight. The only other customers in the diner, an elderly couple, watched the fight with looks of disgust on their faces. Ainsley needed to stop the madness. She was about to reach for her twin, who was now delivering quick jabs to Shelley's stomach, when an arm wrapped around her middle and hauled her backwards. She nearly lost her footing from the force. Stop fighting, Ainsley's boss Martin Moore demanded. He was the owner of Moore's Diner and wasn't amused by the brawl taking place there. She turned to face the red-faced middle-aged man and swallowed. Sir, I'm so sorry for this. I'll tell Presley to leave. I'll... How about you leave with your sister, Miss Smith? I'll call Brenda. She'll cover your shift. 
Sir, I don't need the day off. I just need to... Day off? Miss Smith, I've had enough of that woman coming in here, harassing my employees, wasting my food. I have had enough of your sister starting arguments with her. I am not the principal of a high school, nor do I want to be one. Leave now, and I don't ever want to see any of you ladies in here again. I'll bring back my apron to out. Stop begging. Just leave. His screech caused Ainsley's heart to sink. Great. She needed this job, and now it was gone for good, all because her twin wanted to avenge her. Look on the bright side. You'll have some downtime before you find another job, Presley said, a mile into their three-mile walk back to the trailer they shared. It was forty degrees out, and Ainsley shivered every time the wind picked up. Ainsley wiped her face, which was still sticky from the Shirley Temple. Since you got fired from the movie theater because you keyed Patrick's car, none of us have any money. How did you want me to react when those two went in there, as if they were the ones in the right? Patrick had only dumped you two days before, and that pissed me off. I expected you to do nothing, Presley. Adults move on to a new relationship. We aren't 15 anymore. We aren't 30 either, Presley quipped. Why are you wearing my clothes, Pre? Well, um, you see, what happened was... Ainsley stopped walking and shot her twin a scowl that made her groan. I wanted to prove to Shelley that she was nothing more than a side chick. What did you do, Presley? Ain, you know I love you. You're my twin, my bestie, my ride or die. I couldn't just let that woman harass you. I wanted to humiliate her, so I went to Patrick's apartment dressed like you. I filmed him begging for you back. One of my friends took a picture of us kissing, and I uploaded the picture on Instagram and tagged Shelly and her stupid friends. Don't you worry, Ain. I let Patrick know that I wasn't you. You should have seen his face. Great. And now what? Ainsley was stunned by her sister's admission. Now those two break up and Shelly crawls into a hole and never shows her face again. It wasn't enough for you to get the creep to cheat on his girlfriend. You had to post evidence on social media? Pre, we aren't ever working in this town again. You know that, right? So, then we leave, Presley replied, as if the solution was simple. Right. Like it's easy to pick up and leave. Thanks to the fact that you totaled our last car, we have next to nothing in our accounts. It wasn't my fault. A deer just popped out of nowhere. Ain, trust me, I'll fix this. I'll find a way out for us. Ainsley doubted that her sister could magically make money appear, so she shot Presley a skeptical look. Let's just see if we can get a job cleaning houses, Ainsley said, defeated in every word. Don't you worry, Ain. You won't be cleaning houses. I'm going to find us a way out of here. Ainsley sat up in bed, the chill in the air making her shiver. The freaking heater was out again. She groaned and slid out of her twin-sized bed and flipped on the light. She might as well make some tea. She left her room, which was the size of a closet, and entered the small kitchen. Presley sat on the table, filling out paperwork. Why are you up, Ain? The heat is out again, Ainsley said as she filled the tea kettle up with water. How do you feel about Florida? Presley asked. It had been two weeks since Presley pulled her stunt, and Ainsley was losing hope. Rejections appeared in her inbox moments after they applied for jobs. When she inquired in person about possible work, people shook their heads. She was right when she predicted that the twins would never find work. Meanwhile, Presley acted as though she was having the time of her life. We can't afford to move to Florida, Pre. Forget about the money. If you could afford to move to Florida, where would you go? But I can't move to Florida. Ain, just imagine that you can move to Florida for free. Would you go? 
Fine. I'd go. It's damn cold here. What are you filling out? I ordered an ancestor tracing DNA kit. All I have to do is submit a spit sample. The screeching of the tea kettle prevented Ainsley from yelling at her sister for wasting money. Ainsley quickly poured herself a warm cup of raspberry tea and wasn't surprised when her sister collected her paperwork and rushed out of the kitchen. Ainsley sat at the table and took deep breaths, the stress melting away as she sipped her tea. Everything would be all right. She would find a way out of this mess. All she had was her exhausting twin, whom she loved so much, and she'd make sure that they stayed together. Chapter 2 Sis, wake up, Presley said. Ainsley's aching eyes opened, her body begging her to stay asleep. She was up all night, scouring the internet for jobs. Mm, why? Did you burn something? Ainsley asked through a yawn. No, our driver is coming in five hours. Time's a-wasting. Mm, driver? Ainsley asked, a sinking feeling filling her stomach. Her sister took a deep breath and straightened. Look, Ain, I told you I'd get us out of here. I came up with a solution. And what would that be? Well, Presley's tight smile said it all. The news wasn't going to be positive. I sort of signed us up for a mail-order bride agency. We're going to Florida to marry two men. Ainsley blinked, surprised by the words coming out of Presley's mouth. Is this a prank? No, you're marrying some guy named Kevin, and I'm marrying Paul. According to Cassandra, our matchmaking coordinator, both men will be able to provide for us. We aren't marrying strangers, Ainsley protested. I'm marrying Paul, so either you come with me or stay here and struggle to get a job. Pre was going to get herself killed. That was obvious. Pre, why don't you think about it? We can't go to some random town and marry strangers. We have nothing to our names. If these men are dangerous, we'll be stuck there. We, I'm not stupid, Ain. I read testimonials. Trust me. This is our only option, unless you want to try moving with limited funds. Presley sent her sister a challenging look. I didn't agree to this. I don't have to marry this man. I sort of forged your signature on the contract. Your husband thinks you're coming. If Ainsley didn't love her twin, she would have decked her hard. I'm not. Just go along with it, Ain. It's going to work. Ainsley stood and eyed the small but cozy room she lived in for the past three months. Ever since Patrick tossed her out, the place had been her sanctuary. She eyed the peeling pink wallpaper, the water-stained carpet, and the squeaky bed, and brushed a tear away. You're only giving me a couple of hours to say goodbye to our home? Guilt filled Presley's face. Well, I... I didn't think that through. Pre was hiding something. It was in a way she looked away after speaking. Don't you worry, Ain. We'll come back to Virginia if you want. Mom only has this address. Presley got to her feet. I could care less about some useless postcards. She left us with a paid-off trailer and nothing else. Her twin despised her parents for abandoning them seven years ago, but Ainsley forgave them. Her mother, Kim, delivered twins two days before her 16th birthday. She spent her teenage years taking care of them. Their father, Matt, married her for the good of the children, but the couple divorced and went their separate ways when the twins turned 18. I'll call the post office to see if they can have our mail forwarded. Presley shrugged and left the room. She returned moments later, wheeling a massive scratched-up suitcase. I bought this at the thrift store. Ainsley was unsure she required a suitcase that big. After all, she had a plan. 
fly to Florida and tell her fiancé that she wasn't interested in getting married. Dealing with Patrick's lying, cheating self was enough romance for her. But if she told Presley of her plan, her twin would only pack her things for her. Was it better to go along with the charade? You should grab what you can. I sold the trailer. Presley Ann Smith, tell me you're lying. Ainsley cried. Her stupid parents left the trailer in Presley's name since they didn't believe that she could fend for herself. Get packing, Presley sang, then left the room. She supposed it was her fault for allowing that woman to find them a way out. Miss, I'll take that. The tall, broad-shouldered, impeccably dressed driver insisted. Presley grinned and hopped into the car. Thank you, Ainsley said before joining her sister in the back seat of the black car. Ainsley wore a sweatshirt and jeans, but the winter air still bit at her bones. Presley dressed in leggings and a blue off-the-shoulder short-sleeved top. She was freezing, but hated to cover up. After depositing the luggage in the back, the driver slid into the car. Florida, here we come! Presley screamed when the driver maneuvered the car out of the trailer park. Pre, I hope you know what you're doing. Ainsley, Presley, welcome. A tall, gorgeous woman with chocolate skin and long braids greeted. Despite the fact it was freezing in Virginia, she wore a spaghetti strap dress that touched her knees. Her warm eyes peered at the twins that just entered the private plane. I'm Cassandra, your matchmaking coordinator. I'm so happy to meet you all. Nice to meet you, too. Just to clear things up, I'm Presley, and this is my sister Ainsley. Cassandra's assessing gaze made Ainsley wring her hands. Ainsley considered backing out of the deal, but didn't have a place to go. It wasn't like she'd beg Patrick to move back into the apartment they'd shared. He would only laugh in her face. Hi, Ainsley said. It's nice to meet you both. Did you have a nice trip here? Hell yeah! It isn't every day that I get to use a car service, Pre replied, her eyes shining with excitement. Great. I hope you enjoy the flight. We're flying to Florida, and then we'll reach our destination by yacht. Yay! Presley cheered. People on Insta will be jealous of me. A weary expression briefly crossed the matchmaker's face. Ainsley, figuring that the woman disliked social media, decided that Cassandra was okay in her book. Ainsley shook her head. Why not keep people guessing? No one needs to know what we're doing, Pre. You love books. I love social media. I don't hate on you, she argued. How about we take our seats, Cassandra suggested. The twins sat side by side in reclining seats while Cassandra chose to sit in front of Presley. Ainsley relaxed as the plane slowly ascended. She'd enjoyed the trip and let her fiancé down easily. Two hours later, Ainsley and Presley were lounging on the deck of a yacht. I need sunscreen. I'm about to burn, Ainsley mentally told herself. Her sweatshirt was resting in one of the deck chairs, leaving her in a tank top and jeans. If she wasn't self-conscious about the cellulite on her thighs, Ainsley would have stripped down to her bra and panties. Sweat oozed from every pore of Ainsley's skin, making her desperate for a reprieve. The cooler of the food and drinks sat untouched. Pre continuously took pictures of herself while Ainsley was too nervous to eat. Ladies, I have something to explain, Cassandra said. Presley took one more selfie and glanced at the matchmaker. My husband is a 90-year-old guy, isn't he? Presley asked, dread on her face. Cassandra shook her head. I wanted to talk to you both about Portham Island. It isn't well known. I'm not good with geography. Is Portham Island part of the U.S.? Let's do an Instagram Live. We can educate my followers. No Instagram Live. This island's existence is a secret. Yeah, right. Everything is online. It would be hard to hide an island, Presley argued. 
Tell us about Portham Island, Ainsley reluctantly encouraged. She wrung her hands, trying not to panic. Pre, you got us in deep, Ainsley mentally scolded her sister. Here's a better question. Why can't I film your explanation? What are you hiding? Presley's question made Ainsley want to shake her twin. Who cared about social media? They needed to know more about their mysterious new home. Pre, social media is the least of our worries. This stranger is telling us that Portham Island is a secret island. I'm assuming it's exclusive. Let me guess, only rich people can live there. No, you're missing the point, Ain. Why does Cassandra have a problem with me going to Instagram Live? Wouldn't exposure be good for her business? I think the better idea is for you to see the island for yourself, Cassandra decided. Why not just tell us about the island? Presley demanded. Ainsley had a feeling that Cassandra was holding back because of Presley's insistence on capturing the entire thing on social media. Whether it was a good thing or not remained to be seen. It was just unfortunate that it took 45 minutes for her secret to be revealed. The sun vanished from the sky, taking its heat with it. It was as if the yacht was traveling through a tunnel constructed of darkness. Ainsley and Presley screamed, Ainsley's hands desperately reaching out for her twins. A hand latched onto her wrist as electricity danced over her skin. Then the darkness faded and the electricity vanished. What the hell? Presley screamed, her grip tightening on Ainsley's wrist. Sorry, Presley. I couldn't let you film this. Portham Island is special. Only certain people can pass through its barrier. That's why your application required a DNA sample. Ainsley rubbed her arm, trying to chase away the fear that nearly consumed her. You aren't vampires or zombies, are you? Presley squeaked. Cassandra laughed. No, we're humans that live on a special island. The barrier that surrounds the island keeps us healthy, and we age slower than non-islanders. Presley's eyes grew wide while Ainsley sat there, stunned. Her mind went blank, as if her mind couldn't process what Cassandra was trying to say. Then fear smacked into her heart. What if staying on Portham Island was permanent? Can we leave? Ainsley asked. If things don't work out with your husband, you can return to the mainland, Cassandra assured. Ainsley wasn't planning on having a husband. All she needed to do was ensure that Presley was safe. Then she'd go back to the real world. Chapter 3 Someone was pounding on the door. Figures, it was his new bride ready to express her displeasure. She was probably pissed that he didn't have a garden. Why did I sign up to get a bride? Kevin asked himself. He made his way out of the kitchen and to the door, his heart racing. The women of the island hated his house, since it wasn't much to look at. There were two bedrooms, a dining room, living room, three bathrooms, and kitchen, all squished into one floor. He wasn't rich, and he didn't mind that fact. If only a woman would accept that he wouldn't be the kind of man to shower her with diamonds. He opened the door and saw Paul Sharon standing on the other side. Unfortunately, Paul wasn't alone. He had Emily Blackhawk by his side and they were both shooting Kevin hopeful expressions. Hi, Kevin. Has Cassandra arrived yet with the twins? Paul asked. Kevin had the feeling that he wasn't going to like the conversation with Paul. Paul, why is your ex-girlfriend here with you? Emily blinked, surprised that Kevin wasn't offering niceties. He only had an hour before Ainsley arrived and needed to put the finishing touches on the pineapple upside-down cake. Can we come in? Emily asked. Kevin reluctantly stepped away from the door, wishing he didn't have to deal with these two. My guests will be here in a couple of minutes. You have to make it quick. He invited some of his closest friends over. 
figuring they could have a barbecue in his backyard after the wedding ceremony. Paul rubbed his face. We're sorry to bother you. We just... Do you mind taking Presley in? Emily and I have decided to get back together. I can't marry Presley. I... After Liz stuck her neck out for you, you're going back to the Blackhawks? Paul, you know that Mary is going to make your life a living hell. Kevin couldn't understand the guy's logic. Though Emily was attractive with raven-colored long locks, copper skin, and ocean blue eyes, she wasn't worth the trouble that would ensue once they married. Mary Blackhawk was a bully who toyed with the livelihoods of people for sport. Hell, the woman almost succeeded in Paul getting fired from his job. Emily scowled at Kevin. Things are better between my mother and me. She approves of Paul. In fact, she's planning the wedding herself. Yes, because things always worked out when you have a control freak power over something, Kevin wanted to say. Great, tell Cassandra. Kevin's suggestion made Paul wince. If I back out of the marriage, I will have to pay a fee. Since you're going to marry Ainsley's sister, why not allow her to live here? I'm sure since they're twins, the council will make an exception for Presley. Because I can barely handle one woman. Forget about two. The bell rang, making Kevin curse. He stepped aside and pulled the door open to reveal his closest friend, Salvador Carter. Two bulging bags in his grip. Grabbed your groceries for you, his friend told him. The beginnings of an idea hit Kevin, who would rather not deal with two women criticizing him at every turn. Thanks, Kevin said. He stepped aside and allowed his friend to head to the kitchen. Sal gave the couple a nod as he walked past. You should at least let Cassandra know that you aren't interested, Paul, Kevin said. Paul shook his head. We'll be leaving now. Mary wants us to test wedding cakes in an hour. Kevin allowed the crazy man and his fiancée to leave, figuring that he would have to dream up a speech for Cassandra. Kevin found Sal sitting at the kitchen table drinking a beer. Too busy himself, the husband-to-be working on putting away the groceries. How the hell was he going to plead his case to Sal? Paul backed out of marrying Presley, Kevin blurted out. He turned just in time to see Sal spitting out his beer. He couldn't blame the guy for his shock since the waiting list for the mail-order bride service was a mile long. Emily? Yes. I think Mary Blackhawk is behind this. She would love it if one of Cassandra's brides gets sent packing. Now what? Now you take Paul's place, Kevin suggested. Sal shook his head. I'm not ready for a bride. It's been 20 years since Laura. I'd rather not marry a stranger, Kevin. Besides, whoever I marry will have to be okay with living at the orphanage. I won't force Jill to run the orphanage alone. Kevin hoped that Presley was the charitable type. Her relationship with Sal wouldn't work otherwise. The door slammed open and Tessa and her husband, Thomas, entered the kitchen. Feed me, I'm hungry, Tessa pleaded. She practically dragged her husband to the kitchen table where they both took seats. He loved the troublemaker like a sister. You could have knocked, Kevin said, just to give Tessa crap. You could have knocked last week. Thomas and I were... Sonny, Tom shouted, dismayed by his wife's habit of oversharing. Tessa flicked a dismissive hand. What? We're married, Tom. Why do you care if I tell Kevin stories of the sensual variety? Thomas blushed. It isn't necessary for Mr. Taylor to know what we get up to, Sonny. It's Kevin. Your friends. It's normal to call him by his first name, Tessa insisted. Kevin knew that Thomas only called him Mr. Taylor to annoy his wife. He would have said so but didn't want to spoil the fun for Thomas. Are Kendrick and Julia coming? Kevin asked. No, Layla has a cold, Sal replied. 
before my wife interrupted the two of you, what crisis were you trying to solve? Thomas was observant. Paul backed out of marrying Presley. He thinks that I should marry her instead, Sal summarized. Tessa's face lit up. Maybe this is a good thing. Presley can pick her own husband. We'd have to do some kind of speed dating event so she could narrow the choices down. Sonny, no husband means no citizenship on Portham Island. Thomas gently told his wife. Tessa groaned. Sal, why don't you marry Presley and see how it goes? You can get rid of her if she annoys you. Sal shook his head. I have one divorce under my belt. I don't need another one. The doorbell rang and Kevin cursed. He would have to tell the matchmaker and her client that Paul backed out. Kevin answered the door and smiled. Cassandra stood there with a wide grin on her face. Kevin had the feeling that Paul was planning on backing out the entire time, since having a joint wedding ceremony was his idea. He also insisted on not inviting any of his friends or family. Hey, Cassandra, Kevin greeted. He ushered Cassandra and the two gorgeous women into his house. The twins sighed in relief when the central air hit their skin. Which one of you is Ainsley? The woman with her hair in a messy bun raised her hand. She was stunning, her emerald eyes capturing him in an instant. His heartbeat spiked when his eyes traveled from her face down to her curvaceous body. Her tank top was modest, so he didn't have a view of her cleavage, but her jeans hugged a pair of long, shapely legs. His eyes returned to her face, which was soft and inviting. Where's Paul? Presley asked. Her excited tone made Kevin feel like a tool. He was going to try and break the news to the woman as delicately as possible. Paul, I will deck you the first chance I get, Kevin mentally told the coward. You're actually marrying me. My name is Sal, Salvador said, saving Kevin from the awkward moment. His friend came through. Cassandra frowned. Where's Paul? He decided to get back with Emily. I'm happy to take his place. Ainsley scowled. We didn't sign up for musical grooms. My sister came here to marry Paul Sharon. She didn't sign up for a replacement. She, it's cool, Ain. I like my replacement, Presley said. She pushed past her twin and walked over to Sal, wrapped her arms around the conservative groom, and planted a hot kiss on his lips. Great, he sure hoped that Sal could handle her. After Presley was done kissing her replacement groom, Cassandra led Ainsley and her twin to the spare bedroom, which was three times the size of the closet-sized room that she had in the trailer. The room was lavender with a queen-sized bed, a dresser, and two nightstands. Presley whistled when Cassandra revealed the ensuite bathroom. Seriously, we're having sleepovers, Pre declared. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Was Kevin attractive? Hell yes, but she wasn't ready to marry anyone. The feelings he evoked were concerning. She swore that when he gazed at her with those chocolate-brown eyes, that she would faint right there. Patrick never pulled such a reaction from her, and that was frightening. It was best to pack her bags and look for a job somewhere on the island. Cassandra, do I have to marry Kevin? Ainsley asked. Her twin shot her a horrified look, probably worried that she was about to be found out. Cassandra rubbed her forehead. If you don't marry Kevin, I'll have to send you back to Virginia. The council was adamant about that. Unless you marry, you need to leave. Do I have to stay married to Kevin? Ainsley was desperate for any loophole she could find. Cassandra shook her head. Of course not. But you do have to make an honest try of things. After six months, you'll be a citizen of Portham Island. Six months married to a stranger didn't sound so bad. She'd keep her distance so she wouldn't get attached. Then, when the time was right, she could get a divorce. Okay, then. I'll give this marriage an honest try. 
it was important that her matchmaker didn't catch on. Marrying someone to gain permanent citizenship was probably frowned upon. Great! Now that you'll marry your lovely hunk, let's try on our wedding dresses. I paid extra to rent dresses for us, Ain. Great. Let's get ready. I could use a shower. I... Presley rushed into the bathroom and shut the door. There's another bathroom in the master bedroom, Cassandra said. Ainsley followed the matchmaker out of the room and to an even larger bedroom with a king-sized bed. There was a vase of red roses on both nightstands. It looks like Kevin left you a note, Cassandra said before plucking an envelope out of the vase to the left of the bed. Ainsley looked at it and expected to read something polite like, Welcome to the island. She learned from being in a three-year relationship that men didn't really put much thought into these kinds of things. She opened the card and read, Ainsley, I hope you like the roses. I just wanted to let you know that I'm happy Cassandra found a match for me. I can't wait to get to know you. Kevin. How thoughtful of him, Ainsley said, guilt starting to seep into her heart. Back home, men aren't this eager to marry. Cassandra snorted. There are more men than women on the island. Getting a bride isn't easy for most islanders. Oh, great. Someone that's interested in talking to me won't be easy to avoid. Pre, once this is all over, I'm going to kill you, Ainsley thought to herself. Chapter 4 Where the hell are the brides? Kevin asked two hours later. He was sitting outside in one of the round tables that had been rented for this outdoor wedding. Thomas and his wife Tessa, Asher and his wife Esperanza, Marcus and his wife Liz, Kevin's parents Roy and Anna, and his friend Dustin were in their seats. Sal, who was equally as frustrated, sighed. Women need extra time to get ready. All you men have to do is put on a tux and show up. We have to deal with hair, makeup, cowardly grooms, and other crap. Liz, who was sitting at the other round table with her husband, replied, I have to be back at the orphanage in an hour, Sal chimed in. Might as well start grilling now, Thomas figured. He went back to the house and returned moments later with a pan of marinated meat. He began grilling to his heart's content, the scent of the cooking ribs, chicken, and steak making Kevin's stomach rumble. Reverend Adams exited with a smile on his face. The brides are ready to get married. Everyone take your seats. Thomas remained at the grill while the rest of the guests sat on the chairs that were placed in two rows on the grass. Sal and Kevin stood side by side. A relieved Cassandra exited, followed by the twins. They were both wearing wedding dresses, their golden hair hanging loose. Ainsley's dress was a simple spaghetti strap number that was snug in the right places. Kevin's heart skipped a beat when her eyes met his. He smiled at her, and she nervously smiled back. You may kiss the bride, gentlemen, Reverend Adams declared. Kevin cupped Ainsley's face and brushed his lips against hers. The kiss was long and tender his arms aching to pull her in, but Ainsley abruptly pulled back and began blushing. The move was so endearing that Kevin kissed her on her cheek. You're beautiful, Angel, he whispered to her. You too, her response made him press another kiss to her lips. Get a room, Tessa complained. That caused both of them to look at the other couple. Sal and Presley were kissing so enthusiastically that people were starting to look away. Kevin married the right twin. He would have been embarrassed by such a display. Sal sure had his hands full. Did you like the roses? Kevin's question made surprise flash across his wife's face. Was she shocked that he was making conversation? They were nice, Ainsley softly said. So you hated the roses? You can tell me so I can get you a different type of flowers next time. 
No, no, don't do that. I like the roses. No one has ever gotten flowers for me before. It was thoughtful, and Kevin's lips captured hers again, his body hungering for her. He wrapped his arms around her, and her hands grasped his shoulders. Kevin pulled his mouth from Ainsley's, fighting the urge to deepen his kiss. He wanted to savor the taste of her mouth in private. I love kissing you, wife. Are you hungry? Kind of. Kevin released his hold on Ainsley and pressed his hand to her lower back. He led her over to one of the tables and pulled out her chair. She frowned. Aren't we getting food? I can grab your food for you, Angel. Want chicken, ribs, or steak? Ribs. I'm not picky. I'd eat anything. Kevin walked over to the table that held the side dishes, grabbed a plate, and selected potato salad, Mexican corn, and a helping of mixed vegetables. Then he headed to the grill and smiled at Thomas. What meat would you like? His friend asked. The lady would like ribs. After Thomas put a serving of ribs on the plate, Kevin placed the food and the bottled water he snagged in front of his wife. He kissed the top of her head before getting his own food. Ainsley stared down at the food, as if it morphed into an alien life form. What the hell was going on? Patrick would have insisted that she get her own food. No, wait. He would have told her to grab food for both of them. But Kevin seemed to be happy to make a plate for her. This made no sense. Patrick wasn't the most attractive person in the world, but believed that someone as homely as Ainsley should do his bidding. After all, she should have been grateful that she got a boyfriend. But Kevin was really attractive. If it weren't for the agency, he never would have pursued a woman like her. Why was he treating her so kindly? Was it because he felt obligated to? You okay? A pregnant woman asked before sitting across from Ainsley. She looked exhausted. I just feel overwhelmed, that's all. I was a mail-order bride, too. Believe me, I understand what you're going through. The guys on Portham Island are different. Where are you from? Jersey. You? Virginia. A tall man with dark hair and eyes placed a plate of food and a drink in front of the woman. He kissed her cheek and walked away. That's my husband, Asher. I'm Esperanza. By the way, I'll be your mentor through all of this. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Ainsley popped a spoonful of potatoes into her mouth and savored it. That would be great. I noticed quite a few horses on the streets. There aren't any cars here? Not for everyday use. The council hates change. What if someone is injured? Esperanza grinned. The health professionals do have access to ambulances for emergencies. They mostly wheel patients around. I myself will have a home birth in a few months. I'm not looking forward to it, but my OBGYN doesn't expect me to have any complications. She rubbed her stomach, excitement lighting her eyes. Envy filled Ainsley's heart. She had always wanted a family, but Patrick didn't believe that they could afford one. Presley stormed over, a scowl on her face. Sal wants us to leave. He says that we spent too much time here. He's blaming me for the fact that I can't stay at our reception. You did take two hours to get ready, Pre. Presley scowled. I didn't tell you the worst part. Sal lives. He lives. He lives with his family and refuses to move out. A redhead joined them her bump not as large as Esperanza's. Esperanza, when I asked to mentor someone, I said I'd like to have someone that I could drink with, right? I swear this one's going to drive me to drink. Does your husband want to live with his siblings? Presley shot back. No, my husband's brother tried to kill him, so that would never happen. And that's not what Sal meant. He runs an orphanage with his siblings, He'd never leave his kids. Presley frowned. Well, 
This is perfect. I'm not the mothering type, but I suppose I'll give it a shot. Ainsley got to her feet and pulled her sister into her arms. You'll be great, Pree. Just be yourself. Ainsley's whispered encouragement made her sister relax. You'll visit? Of course, Ainsley replied. Presley released her sister and walked toward the impatient-looking Sal. Tessa, why don't you sit? Esperanza offered. No, thanks. It's hot as hell out here and I'm going home. Ainsley, welcome to the island. Once I give birth, I hope we can grab a drink sometime. Tessa rushed off and Ainsley happily got back to her food. Kevin and Asher joined them a moment later. Kevin sat beside her and placed a chicken wing on her plate. Thanks, but I can't finish this. You can save it for later. So, Ainsley, what did you do in Virginia? I worked at a diner. Ainsley waited for a disappointed expression to cross Kevin's face, but it never came. Esperanza, Tessa, and I are opening up a spa of sorts on Monday. It's a place where men and women can relax. I'm a barber. That explained why he owns such a gorgeous house. Oh, um, if you need help, I'm happy to lend a hand. Thank goodness, Esperanza explained. Are you interested in running the front desk? The woman we hired quit. Sure, Ainsley said. It's a full-time job from nine to six. The pay is twenty an hour. You get an hour paid lunch. I'm sold, Ainsley said, figuring that she'd need to save money so that she could get her own place. She wouldn't dream of taking any of Kevin's assets. He was kind and didn't deserve a leech sucking him dry. No, she'd leave with what she came with. Hopefully, the job would still be on the table after she divorced Kevin. What are you thinking about, Ainsley? Nothing much. Why? Her response made her husband shake his head. It wasn't like Ainsley could say, I'm planning for the day you leave me for someone else. So... She shot him a small smile and continued eating. Chapter 5 Kevin's vibrating phone woke him the next morning. He plucked his phone off the nightstand and discovered Sal's name flashing across the caller ID. Did he discover that his wife was high-strung and needy already? Kevin hated to think it, but he was fortunate that Presley wasn't living in his house. What do you want? Kevin croaked out. Can you hear me? It's Presley. I stole Sal's phone. I'm hiding in the bathroom to talk to you. You could have asked Sal if you could use his phone. I sort of pissed him off, but that's not why I'm calling you. My sister Ainsley is going to probably avoid you. She hates change and tries to avoid feeling attached to people. You need to get out of bed and make her breakfast. Then you should take her out somewhere, Presley instructed. Or I could leave her alone. Presley gasped. No, you don't want to do that. I want you and my sister to be happy. Don't you want that? If Kevin was being honest with himself, he was drawn to the beautiful woman. But he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. The women in the universe tossed in his path were never satisfied with simple men like him. But he'd make an effort. He sure hoped Ainsley was different. What does she like to eat for breakfast? She loves smoothies. Dump Greek yogurt, frozen fruit, milk, two sugar packets in a blender, and you're golden. Activities? Why was he asking? Ainsley was obviously trying to avoid him. After their wedding, she told him that she was tired and didn't leave her room for the rest of the night. Was handing her a smoothie going to bring her out of her shell? Ainsley's boring. Take her to a bookshop or something. Ugh, she likes those things. Got to go, someone's coming. Kevin stared at the clock and groaned. It was 8 a.m. 
If he was going to make his bride breakfast, he would have to head down to the kitchen. Kevin slipped on his flip-flops and shuffled into the kitchen. Dread nearly paralyzed him when he eyed the island. Goodness, he went through hell in this very room. The unwelcomed flashback slammed into him without warning. Grace furiously typed on her phone when Kevin entered the kitchen. The smell of lasagna filled the air. His girlfriend loved Italian food and often talked about wanting to go to the Italian restaurant on the other side of the island. Kevin only said no because his bank account couldn't suffer such foolishness. Grace, you hungry? I guess, she grumbled, her brown eyes still glued to the phone. Despite her inattentiveness, Kevin still found her beautiful. Her luscious dark brown hair was straightened and had blonde highlights. Her face was glowing as a result of the facial he had paid for. He assumed that the massage would take away the stress she always carried, but he supposed that a massage wasn't going to get rid of her uptight personality. He plated her a piece of lasagna and placed it in front of her. Before he could get her silverware, she lifted her head and scowled. Why didn't you take me out for dinner? I figured we could eat here. I wanted... Grace got to her feet and snarled as if Kevin did something offensive. You're so cheap. You don't buy me things. Take me anywhere. And now this? She lifted the plate from her table and flung it against the wall. I'm going to find me a man that showers me with gifts. She left the house without looking back. Kevin shook his head. There was no way Ainsley was going to toss his smoothie in his face. She'd drink it. Presley understood her twin better than anyone. The only question Kevin had was, why change things? She could stay in her little corner and be the companion he needed when times were too quiet. But what if Ainsley was different? Kevin would make the smoothie, and if Ainsley threw a fit, he would treat her like a roommate. A knock on the door caused Ainsley's eyes to fly open. The sunlight streaming into the guest room told her that it was definitely past morning. She sat up and stretched, momentarily confused about who'd be knocking. Ainsley, are you up? Crap. Her husband came looking for her. It was fortunate that Kevin understood that she wasn't about to share a bed with him. It was easy to feign exhaustion and hide out in the guest room. What now? She couldn't spend most of Sunday in bed. Come in. Ainsley stood and made her way to the bathroom to go through her morning routine. She took extra time, not wanting to make a mistake. Butterflies began dancing in her stomach when a replay of the kiss suddenly popped into her mind. Wow, Kevin was a good kisser, and she wanted it to happen again. Ainsley shook her head. Kevin is incredibly attractive. There's no way he's satisfied with who Cassandra chose. He's only married you because he didn't want to leave you hanging. He only came back to check on you to make sure you were still alive. Don't get attached, Ainsley mentally told herself. When she marched out of the room and spotted him, confusion filled her. Patrick would have left if he hadn't found her in bed. Presley mentioned that you like smoothies, so I made you one for breakfast. He gestured to the glass on the nightstand. When did you talk to Presley? This morning. I figured we could go out today. We have a library. I heard you love books. A man that was actually taking her twin suggestions was rare. Presley tried giving Patrick date ideas once, and he told Presley, Ainsley's gonna be happy with wherever I take her. She has no choice. She smiled at Kevin, thankful that he was being kind. I'd love that. But what about you? Kevin frowned. What about me? The day belongs to both of us, Kevin. We can't spend the day at the library unless you enjoy reading. 
Ainsley planned on grabbing a book and leaving the library as quickly as possible. Uncertainty entered Kevin's beautiful eyes. That expression touched something deep in Ainsley's heart. She reached out and grasped his hand. I just want us to both enjoy this day. He nodded in understanding. I like mini golf. We can do that after we find some books. That was a fair compromise, but Ainsley's insides quivered. She wasn't the sporty type and despised the outdoors. But for Kevin, she supposed she would do it. Kevin glanced down at their joined hands. Aren't you hungry? Not really. I'm dreading mini-golf. I don't want to look stupid in front of you, Ainsley mentally replied. Yes. Um, it shouldn't take me long to drink it. I'll meet you downstairs in a half an hour. Kevin nodded and pressed a gentle kiss to Ainsley's lips and left her alone with her racing heart. Kevin paced the kitchen, hating the nerves that crashed through him. Damn it, he couldn't possibly screw up today. All they were going to do was walk to the library, and he'd watch her as she picked out books. If she was lost in a book, he'd dismiss the idea of mini-golf. Ready to go? Ainsley asked, jolting him out of his thoughts. Kevin's wife was dressed in a tank top, jean shorts, and sneakers. Her golden hair was up in a haphazard bun. Of course, Kevin said before slipping his hand in hers. He glanced down at Ainsley's bare ring finger. I need to get you a wedding band. We should visit the jewelers. Why don't we wait to exchange rings until we know each other better? Right. Ainsley wasn't completely sold on being stuck with him. Kevin tamped down the disappointment and led his bride out of their home. It was already scorching outside, which made Kevin relieved that the library wasn't too far away. Ainsley's eyes lit up when someone rode by on a black horse. I want to learn to ride. I can take you horseback riding sometime, Kevin offered. His wife shot him a thoughtful expression. So... I figured that now we could talk about the financial situation, like how much money is our mortgage, how much do I have to contribute toward the bills. We should go figure out who will do which chores. When I lived with Patrick, I needed to take on most of the chores since his social commitments kept him busy. Social commitments? Like what? Let's see. He was part of a bowling league, so... Would bowl on Sundays... On Wednesdays, he played pool with his co-workers. He spent Friday nights at the bar. Saturday was our date night. And what about you? Kevin was in utter disbelief that a woman who looked like Ainsley would actually prioritize a man that much. While he was with Stacy, he'd be lucky if she allowed him to get a day to himself. Me? I worked two jobs to pay the bills. I was a waitress at Moore's Diner and a cashier at the grocery store. Patrick worked at the steel mill. Did you go to college? Regret filled Ainsley's eyes. I wish I did, but we grew up poor. My parents had us when they were 16. They did their best, but not good enough to pay for college. I only managed to get a partial scholarship to college but I couldn't afford the rest. Managed? Ainsley, that in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment. Why downplay it? Ainsley blushed. I, I don't know. What were you interested in studying? Business administration. Why not English? Because I wanted to get a job that would support Pre and me. Her selflessness warmed his skeptical heart. Kevin was so used to takers that he never considered he could be married to someone so giving. He figured that good women only belonged to his fortunate guy friends. I never thought about going to college. I just wanted to make my own way, so I left at 18. Did you have a bad home life? No. It was great. When I was younger... I just had something to prove. 
He guided Ainsley into the air-conditioned library, only to see the last person he wanted to see. Chapter 6 Ainsley knew when someone ran into an ex they no longer communicated with. She could tell by Kevin's get-me-out-of-here expression. She remembered shooting Pre the same look whenever they ran into Patrick. The bombshell blonde sitting behind the desk's face briefly filled with regret before she shot Kevin a hopeful smile. Kevin, is this one of Sal's orphans? The woman asked. Ainsley ignored the jab. No, this is my wife, Ainsley, Kevin replied, his hand squeezing hers. The disappointment in the librarian's blue eyes made pride fill Ainsley. That's right, lady. You let a good man go, and now you're disappointed that you have no chance of getting him back, Ainsley silently thought. Oh, I see. You know the drill. Did Ainsley sign up for a membership online? Oh, crap. I didn't think to ask Kevin how to sign up for a library card. What a mess. Ainsley's worries made a blast of heat slam into her skin. I signed her up this morning. She's under Ainsley Taylor. She shot a relieved smile in her handsome husband's direction having the feeling that the well-dressed mystery woman would have relished turning them away. The woman angrily typed something into her computer and nodded. That was their cue to explore. What kind of books do you like? Kevin asked as soon as they walked away from the desk. Crime and horror. Kevin wrinkled his nose. Dark and bloody. More like mystery with a bit of gore. I'm obsessed with true crime documentaries. But it didn't always used to be that way. When I was a kid, I loved books with dogs. I even begged my parents to let me get a dog. But they said no. I got into true crime after reading an autobiography about a woman who escaped her kidnapper. Now that I'm working reasonable hours, I can set aside time to watch them. We have cable, right? And every streaming service you can think of. What do you read? Kevin shook his head. I'm more of a music guy. I sometimes play my guitar. Can you sing? Ainsley enjoyed karaoke and hoped that Kevin would duet with her. He nodded. Do you play an instrument? I always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. Can you teach me? Sure. Ainsley squealed when she spotted a horror novel that she had been dying to read. She quickly snatched the book off the shelf and admired the cover. You just can't wait to read that thing, Kevin teased. I've been dying to read this book for months. Between work and chores, I never had the time. Why don't I give you a tour of the second floor? For a moment, Ainsley envisioned Kevin sneaking her off to a corner so they could make out. The thought of kissing him again caused butterflies to do the cha-cha slide in her stomach. Sure. Her breathy voice made Kevin's gaze linger on her lips. He led her down another aisle, far from the prying eyes of his ex, and he gently took the book from her hand and let it fall to the floor. Then his lips were on hers. Ainsley couldn't help but get lost in the kiss. His lips were plump and soft, his tongue skilled and daring. She gladly kissed him without thought, her toes aching from holding most of her weight. She clung to his shoulders as his arms held her close. When he pulled away, Ainsley wanted to drag him back to her. But then she remembered that they were in a library, and someone would come upon them. Does this place have cameras? Ainsley nearly shrieked. Kevin shrugged. I don't know, Angel, 
but I would have kissed you either way. Ainsley blushed. The next time you kiss me like that, you should check that sort of thing. You wouldn't want us giving people a show. Kevin gently kissed her lips. Come on, you're going to love the second floor. After picking up the book from the carpet, he took Ainsley's hand and they walked to the elevator. They snuck in a kiss on the elevator ride like two hormonal teenagers. When it opened, the smell of coffee hit Ainsley's nose. There's a cafe on this floor. I figured you could grab lunch and start reading. Ainsley's eyes studied the tables, which were mostly occupied by people with their tablets or books. Some were eating while others sipped drinks as they read. What will you do to entertain yourself? Ainsley asked. Kevin pointed at the television, which was displaying a sports game. Watch that. Now come on. Are you a fan of sandwiches? Yes, Ainsley replied. They both ordered turkey and cheese with the works, and while Kevin opted for coffee, Ainsley ordered raspberry tea. They sat close to the big screen so Kevin could watch his game. After snarfing down her food, Ainsley began reading the book she picked out. Anger made Stacy's fingers tremble when she made the call. This crazy plan wasn't going to work. No one expected Kevin Taylor, Mr. Perfect, to sign up for Cassandra Hall's mail-order bride service. Now that he had, the plan was blown to bits. Vince Draper's plan of seduction wasn't going to work. The Black Hawk name meant nothing, which meant that Mary couldn't use her influence. Diana Adams was a secret ally of Cassandra's. Sighing, Stacy made a call. What? A harsh female snapped. I need your help. Kevin's married. There's no way he'll take me back. Did you apply for the secretary's job? I paid Allison to quit. It hasn't posted yet. I... The spa opens tomorrow. What are they waiting for? The devious tone made Stacy quiver. But this was worth getting the Lawsons back for what they had put her sister through. After both men used her body, Emma was discarded like trash. Maybe they have someone already, Stacy suggested. If they do, make the employee quit. It shouldn't be hard. Book an appointment tomorrow and see who's working behind the desk. The cranky woman hung up without a goodbye. Luckily, Stacy memorized Greg Adams' credit card number before they broke up. That was the only way she could afford such extravagance. The sun was scorching, the day not even offering up a breeze. But Ainsley barely noticed the oppressive heat. She couldn't stop laughing. She was terrible at mini-golf. She tried hitting the ball again, and it somehow went sideways. You're holding the club wrong, Angel, Kevin laughed. He gently gripped her wrist, sensations traveling up and down her body from his touch. Her heartbeat tripled, her concentration going to crap. All she wanted to do was experience a repeat performance of the kiss they had shared in the library. Kevin gently showed her how to hit the ball, then stepped back. She could have been tutored by Tiger Woods himself, and it wouldn't have made a difference. She laughed as yet another ball went haywire. Kevin was good at mini-golf, his ball always making it into the hole. It was incredible. The man never missed. She enjoyed the smile that stretched across his face every time he swung the golf club. It made her heart squeeze to see him happy. Kevin, is that you? An overly cheerful male voice said, causing his back to stiffen. Ainsley turned to see a man that belonged in a boy band. He was tall, slightly muscled, blonde, with a pretty face. Not Ainsley's type at all. Greg, Kevin said. Who's the beauty with you? At that very moment, 
Ainsley regretted not allowing Kevin to take her to the jewelry store, but she couldn't force him to spend money on her if she wasn't sure that she'd stay married to him. My wife, Ainsley, Kevin coolly replied. The man glanced down at Ainsley's bare hand and shook his head. If you were mine, I would have put a ring on your finger, he replied. Crap, what now? Kevin and I are actually exchanging rings a month from now. I thought it would be fun to get to know one another first. We're going to pick out each other's rings and surprise one another. Isn't that romantic? Why did you say a month? I meant six months. Ainsley, you can't stay with Kevin. He's a stranger. And what your feeling is? Well, it's hormones. No matter what Ainsley told herself, she still enjoyed when Kevin rested a hand on her lower back. Greg forced a smile. I bet you the flashy diamond type. I hope you're not a betting man, because you're wrong. Kevin, we have somewhere to be. Judging by the disbelief in Greg's eyes, he obviously expected a different response from Ainsley. It's getting late. Let's go home for dinner, Kevin agreed. After putting the equipment back where it belonged, Kevin and Ainsley began their long walk home. She waited until they were halfway down the block before she spoke. I had fun today. I can't wait to finish reading my book. Glad you did. Thanks for trying golf. It's fun. Even though I suck at it, I still want to play again. Kevin grinned. I might try a horror novel. You should. I want to start a book club. I wonder if anybody would be interested in joining. I'm sure people will be interested in joining your book club. Quartum Island has an online bulletin board you can put your idea on. Ainsley loved the support. Patrick would have told her it was a stupid idea. Why am I comparing Kevin to Patrick? They are different people, Ainsley thought to herself. Things are different around here. You didn't have a book club to join in Virginia? No, my sister and I were outcasts. Things only got worse after Presley decided to get into a fistfight with my ex's new girlfriend, Ainsley said. Then she told Kevin about the dramatic event. So, Presley's solution to getting you fired was signing you up for a mail-order bride service, he asked, a hint of humor on his face. Yes, it was. Why did you sign up for Cassandra's service? Loneliness, Kevin said. That answer surprised Ainsley. A guy like him was lonely? Kevin's admission made Ainsley's heart ache. She promised herself that she would try to settle into her new life. She just hoped that Kevin was satisfied with a wife like her. Chapter 7 Ainsley practically floated into the kitchen the next morning, excitement making her heart feel like it would explode. For the first time, Ainsley had a day filled with fun and good conversations and the kisses Kevin gave her were passionate. She was disappointed her husband wasn't sitting at the kitchen table. She rooted around the cupboard until she found a tea kettle. She went about preparing her morning cup of tea. Fifteen minutes later, Ainsley was at the table, nibbling on buttered toast. She made some for Kevin and started his coffee pot. Kevin, when in the hell was he going to make an appearance? She dreamt about him last night. Ainsley blushed when she recalled what her subconscious dredged up. Before she could fan herself, the doorbell rang. Ainsley got to her feet, brushed down her skirt, and opened the door. She noticed the bouquet of white roses first. Then her eyes traveled upward to Greg's smiling face. Are those for your mother? Ainsley asked figuring that Greg was stopping by just to say a quick hello. Confusion entered Greg's eyes. No, these are for you. Me? Why? 
We got off on the wrong foot. These are apology flowers. Would you like to go to dinner with me? Ainsley frowned. What did you bring for Kevin? Nothing. Why? You offended him, too, and I don't know what his plans are, but we'll let you know about dinner. He handed Ainsley the flowers as if he were giving her a winning lottery ticket. She reluctantly took the apology flowers, thinking that she would pawn them off on someone else. There was something off-putting about Greg. She didn't want to keep anything he bought for her. Are you going to invite me in? Was this guy seriously overstaying his welcome? Sorry, Greg. I'm getting ready for work. She stepped back and shut the door in Greg's face. She turned to see an annoyed Kevin standing there. Give me those. Ainsley gladly handed the flowers over and Kevin walked over to the trash can and tossed them in. Ainsley went back to her seat and returned to her breakfast, forgetting all about Greg. How are things going? Esperanza asked as soon as Kevin and Ainsley walked through the doors of the LDT spa. Her eyes bounced around the tranquil reception area, which included cushy seats, fake palm trees bookending the seating area, and a reception desk. There was also a water cooler and a wine cabinet. Things are great, Ainsley said. Kevin kissed Ainsley's cheek. I'd better get to work. Have a nice day. After Kevin walked through the door leading to the hallway that held the rooms, Esperanza grinned. Is there anything you want to ask me about? This has been quite the experience. Kevin showed me how to order groceries and where to get necessities. He just, Ainsley, debated asking the question. I think I ran into Kevin's ex at the library. Which one? I don't know. She looked like she wanted him back, and I think he wants nothing to do with her. I just... Mm, how do you deal with exes? The men we married have pasts. Esperanza chuckled. Emma Adams was one of Asher's exes, and she was horrible. Esperanza explained how troublesome Emma was and how she resolved the situation. Then, she led Ainsley to the reception desk where she provided her a tablet and the login information. Her job was easy. All Ainsley needed to do was answer the phone and check people in for their appointments. I'm going to go get my station ready. I hired another hairstylist since I'll be on maternity leave soon, Esperanza told her. Esperanza happily patted her baby bump. Do you know what you're having? No, Asher and I want to be surprised. I'm thinking of starting a book club. Would you like to join? Interest lit Esperanza's brown eyes. Sure. I'd love to. It sounds fun. I'll text the other girls. I know that Julia and Liz will be into it. Tessa will probably come for the camaraderie. Awesome! Good luck on your first day. Thanks, you too, Esperanza said before walking away. I'm here for my appointment, the librarian from yesterday said. It was right after lunch, and Ainsley had a relative easy day. But the trouble alarm rang in her head when she spotted this woman. She was tall, fit, and her makeup was on point. Ainsley could even smell the woman's strawberry-scented body spray. Was that Kevin's favorite scent? Sure. Your name? I'm dying to see your wedding ring. Kevin has such good taste. Ainsley's temper rose. We're exchanging rings at the end of the month. Your name? Stacy Stevens. How did you get your job? Did you apply online? 
What an odd question, Ainsley decided to ignore the woman and typed in her name. The woman was getting a Swedish massage, facial, and haircut. She forced a smile. You're all set. Tessa will come get you for your massage in five minutes. Have a seat. You didn't answer my question. How did you get this job? She pulled her iPhone out of her designer purse and held it up. It was obvious that Stacy was filming. Why don't you have a seat, Stacy? Ainsley firmly said. Because I'm pissed as hell that you stole my opportunity. I paid Allison to quit with the intentions of applying for this job. But no, you just walk in and steal my spot. Stacy took in Ainsley's appearance and shook her head. Think about it, Ainsley. Kevin has a type, and you're not it. After that burn, Stacy took her seat. Ainsley tried not to let Stacy's words bother her. After all, she was an ex for a reason. There was no way Kevin would abandon her for someone else, right? If life taught Ainsley anything, it was that bonds didn't matter. Her mother willingly abandoned her when the law gave her permission to. After two years of living together, Patrick decided that Shelley was the one for him. You look sad, twin. Who do you want me to punch? Presley asked, knocking Ainsley out of her thoughts. She instinctively glanced over at the sitting area and didn't spot Kevin's ex. Tessa must have collected the high-maintenance woman while Ainsley was stuck in her head. Nothing. Sal smiled at her. Hi, Ainsley. I'm Sal. It's nice to meet you. I thought I would surprise Presley with an appointment. That's fantastic. I never went to a spa before. What am I getting? A facial, Ainsley replied after looking her sister up. Carla should be here to get you in about 15 minutes. Ain, you're upset about something. Tell me what it is or I'll ask Kevin. We're BFFs now. It wasn't like she was going to express herself in front of Sal, Kevin's best friend. No, wait. Maybe she should casually bring up Stacy. I had a run-in with Stacy Stevens. Sal scowled. That woman is nothing but trouble. Why? Pree's question was asked with a bit of heat. Ask Kevin about it, Ainsley. It's not my place to tell you about her. Why do people always say stuff like that? Presley complained. Because it's part of setting appropriate boundaries, Pre. It isn't good to gossip, Ainsley lectured. But everyone does it. It's just that I'm honest about it. Sal shot his wife a patient look. Pre, whatever you do, don't go snooping, Ainsley warned. I never make promises, Ain. You know that. Ugh. If she could only throttle her sister. Thankfully, Carla the aesthetician chose that moment to make an appearance. She ushered Presley into the room where facials were held, leaving her with Sal. Sal made his way to the seating area and sat. So much for keeping her company, Ainsley thought to herself. Kevin let out a relieved breath when he was in front of the television with a cold beer in hand. Ainsley escaped to her room, obviously upset about something. She was clearly different from the dramatic women that usually gravitated to him. Kevin knew that his wife would need coaxing. He knew one person that could tell him how to woo Ainsley, but she was probably busy with orphans. Kevin played an episode of a crime show and took his beer into the kitchen. He stared at the contents of the fridge. His ears pricked when he heard Ainsley approaching. He contemplated if he should sneak a kiss. He felt her hand rest on his back. I figured I could take care of dinner. Kevin slowly turned to face his wife. 
He wrapped his arms around her and rubbed her back. Her arms held him close, her body relaxing against his. What's wrong, Angel? Kevin asked. Just dealt with a difficult customer. I'm fine, Kevin. What did this customer say to you? Kevin would go through the security tape and ban anyone that dared mess with her. It isn't a big deal, Kevin. I'm fine. He vowed to find out why his wife, who was open to him a day before, was so upset. Chapter 8 Ainsley walked into the apartment that she shared with Patrick. The scent of cigarette smoke smacked her in the face. She wrinkled her nose, hating when her boyfriend smoked in their home. She entered the living room, which was filled with second-hand furniture that Ainsley found at yard sales. Ainsley paced the space, her green eyes shooting sparks at Shelley, the woman who had been texting Patrick for a month. They argued about Shelley on the previous night. You're insecure, Ainsley. It isn't Shelley's fault that she's more attractive than you are. Those cold words were uttered right before Patrick grabbed a comforter from the closet and told her that he was sleeping on the couch. Don't go, I'm sorry, Ainsley had pleaded. But Patrick slammed the squeaky door behind him, not bothering to ease Ainsley's fears. You tell her! Pre hissed, a finger pointed at Patrick, who looked annoyed. They didn't speak that morning. Was he still upset? Tell me what? Ainsley asked. She spotted a pile of boxes by the door. Was Shelley moving in? Ainsley, things aren't working out between us. It's best you live with your sister. Those boxes all contained Ainsley's things. Patrick was tossing her away like she was one of his worn tennis shoes. No, this was supposed to be the father of her children. They talked about getting married, and now it was all over. They, before Ainsley's eyes, Patrick morphed into Kevin. I'm sorry, Ainsley. I want to be with Shelley. She's everything I ever wanted in a woman, her husband told her. Ainsley looked at Shelley, who grinned. Kevin doesn't like predictable. Ainsley, it's okay, Kevin said, his arms wrapping around her. Somehow, she was cradled in his lap, her wet face pressed to his chest. Was she crying? She blinked away the tears and looked up at Kevin, who was concerned. Do you have feelings for Stacy? She blurted out. Kevin sighed. No, that woman is trouble. <laughs> That's what Sal said. Why is she trouble? Who's Patrick? I heard you saying his name in your sleep. Ainsley winced. He's my ex. I was dreaming about the day he kicked me out of our apartment. He found a much prettier replacement. Despite all the years I put him first, I wasn't good enough. Ainsley decided not to tell Kevin that Patrick changed into him. Kevin's arms tightened, making Ainsley feel safe. She snuggled into him, the anxiety that lingered from her dreams slowly dissipating. You still want to be with him? Hell no. Seeing someone that looked like Shelley triggered the dream. Yeah, she wasn't telling her husband that she was worried that he wasn't attracted to her. You were humiliated that someone you spent so much time with abandoned you? Yes, exactly. My life was filled with people that didn't stick with me. Hell, my own parents left me. I'll never forget it. On my 18th birthday, I came home from school thinking that there would be a cake waiting for me. Since Pre wasn't on student council, I got home later than her. When I showed up, Mom and Dad were standing in front of the trailer, packed bags at their feet. You should have seen how stupid I was. I thought they were taking me on a trip for my birthday. All Mom said was, Go talk to your sister, sweetheart. We'll see you soon. 
and then they hopped into a cab and left. I went inside and Preet told me that my parents wanted to live a different life. Now that we were 18, we could figure it out. Pre was crushed while I was embarrassed. Our high school graduation was six weeks away and they couldn't wait until then to leave? It took some time, but I realized I shouldn't be so angry with them. They paid off the trailer, so it wasn't like we were homeless. So I worked two jobs, found a guy, got out of the trailer park, and was sent right back to it. Did you love Patrick? I don't know anymore. In truth, she wanted Patrick for all the wrong reasons. Ainsley could see that now. When she saw Kevin, joy filled her. When he held her, she felt like she was home. That's why the thought of losing him evoked fear in her. Want to watch some TV to get your mind off this? We can watch a crime show. Sure, Ainsley said, not wanting to revisit that dream. Kevin turned on the TV and repositioned them so that he was lying down with Ainsley on the bed beside him. He turned on the crime show, and she snuggled into him, and they watched documentaries until they fell asleep. It was barely 7 a.m., and the doorbell was ringing. The other side of the bed was empty, which meant that Kevin snuck back into his room. He probably thought she was a nutcase. Whoever was at the door was persistent, which meant that the noise wouldn't stop until she opened the door. Ainsley slipped out of bed and padded to the door. She opened it to find Greg Adams standing there with a bulging paper bag in his grip. Hi, Ainsley. I thought I would have some breakfast with both of you. Why don't I come in? Because we didn't invite you, Ainsley replied, fighting a yawn. I don't even think Kevin's awake. Ainsley didn't realize her mistake until Greg spoke. Shouldn't you know if your husband's awake? You're sharing a room. Damn. Uh, I woke up a couple of hours before him and spent time in the kitchen to... Ainsley, you look like you just woke up. No need to lie to me. Is there trouble in paradise? Did you have a fight? This Kevin acting like a jerk? Can I help? Considering that you're the breakup of a lot of relationships, I don't think she needs your advice. Ainsley turned to face Kevin and her heart rate increased at the sight. He was in nothing but black boxers, his toned stomach begging to be caressed. The butterflies that he always caused came to the surface, and all she wanted to do was touch him. Last night, she was too distracted by her sadness to explore his skin. Ainsley reached out and caressed his chest, which made him smile. Once we get rid of this idiot... You can explore all you like, Angel, Kevin said, which made Angely squeak. She pulled her hand from his chest and escaped the situation, disbelieving that she checked out her husband in front of Greg. Her only excuse was that she couldn't help it. Kevin was beautiful inside and out, and she was beginning to crave every part of him. Greg, what are you doing here? Kevin wanted to punch him in the jaw, a warning shot to stay away from Ainsley. I just wanted to make things right. Why? Kevin would accept an apology only to get rid of the man. We used to be friends, Kevin. Don't you miss the old days? At one point, Greg Adams was like a brother to him. They would play golf, play guitar, fish, and watch sports together but those days were over. Sometimes, but things are never going to be the same between us. You stabbed me in the back. Stacy isn't worth it, man. I did you a favor. That woman is a gold digger. She's up to no good. I never should have bothered with her. I accept your apology. Just stay away from my wife. Kevin snapped. Greg shook his head. 
She is my type. I figured I would just butter her up so she would put in a good word for me. Kevin didn't believe Greg for a second. Ainsley was beautiful, kind, generous, intelligent, alluring, and, well, he couldn't believe that every man wasn't knocking down his door trying to steal her from him. Think about it. I gave her white roses. That doesn't scream romance. I just want you to come to poker night on Saturday. No thanks, Kevin said. Just take the breakfast. I'll get something else for me. Greg's sad eyes didn't move Kevin. Yes, he was sorry, but this man would betray him again if it was worthwhile. The orphanage will appreciate the food, Kevin said as he stepped back and closed the door in his former best friend's face. After that unpleasant conversation, Kevin deserved a reward. He walked into the kitchen and found Ainsley at the counter making coffee. The tea kettle was already on the stove. As soon as the coffee pot was running, she turned to face Kevin, an uncertain look on her face. He couldn't help himself. He strolled over to her and pulled her in for a kiss. Kevin's kiss started out gentle, but his control quickly vanished when his wife touched his skin. Her hesitant hands explored his chest, her fingers driving him crazy. He deepened his kiss, his entire being concentrated on the wife he desired more every day. His tongue explored her mouth as his hands began stroking the skin under her shirt. The shrieking of the tea kettle interrupted their kiss. He slowly pulled away from her, a soft smile on his face. Good morning, he said. Morning, Ainsley rasped out. I'm going to put some clothes on. I'll see you in a bit. Kevin went into his room, took a shower, changed into his work clothes, and joined his wife in the kitchen. He was tempted to kiss her again, but he refrained. He didn't want to be late for work. Chapter 9 I have a surprise for you, Kevin said two days later. Ainsley finished locking the tablet and was just about to slip it into her messenger bag. She smiled at her husband, craving another one of his kisses. What would that be? she asked, curious. Kevin winked. It's a surprise. I can't tell you. Before Ainsley could press him, Esperanza joined them. Jill talked Asher and I into having a co-ed baby shower at the orphanage. I know it's last minute, but would you both like to come? You don't have to bring a gift for my baby. Asher and I have everything we need, but we are encouraging everyone to make a donation to the orphanage. We'll be there, Kevin said, a grin on his face. Perfect. I'm going to meet Asher for dinner, so I'll see you guys tomorrow, Esperanza said before exiting the spa. Now that she's gone, you can tell me what the surprise is, Ainsley insisted. Kevin laughed. Do you know the definition of a surprise? I don't like surprises. Just tell me. No. You'll like this one, trust me. After Ainsley secured the iPad, Kevin hooked his arm through his wife's and led her out of the spa. It was evening, but the heat was still aggressive. Ainsley couldn't help but think she'd take the heat over bitter cold any day of the week. Kevin led her to an Italian restaurant two blocks away. Ainsley was relieved that Kevin made reservations. They were led to a table in the middle of the restaurant and Ainsley happily sat. A dinner was a touching surprise since it meant that she didn't have to scrounge something together. A stunning brunette walked over to the table, her brown eyes studying Kevin. He wasn't even checking out the beautiful woman, which was confusing to Ainsley. Patrick's eyes always wandered when they were on dates, 
He said it was because looking at the same plain face over again got boring after a while. I can look, Ainsley. It isn't like I'm touching, right? He usually followed that statement up with one of his laughs, making her feel empty. But her husband didn't seem to take interest in the waitress. Good evening. Here are some menus. Can I interest you both in something to drink? I'd like some water, thanks, Ainsley said, trying to cut down on the bill as much as possible. I'd like a beer and please get the lady a red sangria. I think she'd love it. Ainsley blinked. That's expensive. I, Kevin, held up a hand. You worry too much, Angel. Just relax and enjoy the night. Ainsley took a deep breath and followed her husband's advice. My parents want you over for dinner on Sunday. They wanted to wait for a week to meet you, Kevin told his wife. Ainsley seemed happy enough. She was eating eggplant parmesan between sips of her drink. He was kind of nervous about her surprise, but knew that she might like it. He wanted his bride to feel at home. It was important for him to make his wife happy, no matter the cost. Losing her at this point would hurt like hell. What are your parents like? My father, Roy, thinks he's a comedian, so prepare for a few stupid jokes. Mom's name is Anna, and she loves cooking, gardening, and arguing with my father. It's playful, never hateful. They will love you. Ainsley grinned. I hope so. It would be nice to have a mother figure since mine disappeared seven years ago. Haven't you heard from her? She hasn't called in months. She does send us postcards once in a while. I suppose I should call her to let her know I'm no longer in Virginia. Do we have it in the budget to get a phone? We should. He didn't want to ruin another surprise he ordered for her, and so didn't elaborate. I think I want to head back to the library tomorrow night. I finished my book. Ainsley, you don't have to ask my permission when you want to go somewhere. Go to the cafe, get yourself some dinner, and enjoy your book. Ainsley shot Kevin a grin. Right. It did sound like I was asking your permission. I need to get used to the fact I am no longer in Virginia. New home, new me. Speaking of changes, Esperanza expressed interest in joining my book club. Tessa said she'd join as long as there was food. Julia and Pri are in. I guess I could put up a bulletin for a couple more members in the future. But I kind of want to do the word-of-mouth thing. Kevin agreed. His wife didn't need the pressure of having tons of island folk poking around their home. Before he could express that sentiment, Grace, one of his exes, approached with a smile on her face. She was tall, with chocolate-brown skin and dark brown shoulder-length hair. She made sure to flash her giant diamond when she approached. Kevin, what brings you here? She asked, her eyes on Ainsley, who was fidgeting. Eating dinner with my wife. His response exhibited a squeal from Grace. Oh, yay! Let's see the ring. Kevin has good taste. I love a good romance. Where did you get married? How did you meet? I'm a mail-order bride. Since I'm getting to know Kevin, we're exchanging rings at the end of the month. Grace clapped her hands. How romantic! If you need help picking out Kevin's ring, let me know. I love jewelry, and you don't look like the type who likes to shop. Shopping can be a headache for some people. My sister Edna is the same way. I'm glad I ran into both of you. Have a nice night. Ainsley frowned. Was that one of your exes? Sure was. We haven't dated in 30 years. Why do you ask? She looks like a beauty queen. I sure hope so, since she's married to one of the richest people on the island. If you met me before we got married, would you have chosen me? 
Yes. You're beautiful, kind, thoughtful, intelligent, generous, a hard worker, all of the qualities I was looking for. Cassandra really did send me the perfect match. Ainsley breathed easier. You have a type, and I'm not it. A type? Stacy and Grace are both girly girls who carry themselves a certain way. Which is why they are exes, Ainsley. If they were so great, we would have been married by now. Ainsley nodded. I suppose that makes sense. By the way, thank you for your surprise. Kevin frowned. You haven't received it yet. Ainsley shook her head. I thought dinner was the surprise. No. You'll get your surprise after dessert. Can you give me a hint? She pleaded. You'll like it. Ainsley groaned. Can you give me a better hint? It's waiting for you at home. Really, Kevin? Those hints suck. Is it a book? No. Um, is it a lunchbox? No. A dress? No. And on and on Ainsley tried to pick his brain, but her guesses never came close. A golfing instructor? Ainsley asked as they were on their way home. She really hated surprises. Kevin chuckled. Do you think that could actually help? No, but it's a good guess. Before you ask, it isn't a cooking instructor, Kevin replied. He squeezed her hand, sending warmth through her. Dance instructor? Ainsley guessed. What's worse, your golf game or your dancing skills? Ainsley recalled her sister trying to teach her how to dance and winced. Probably my dancing skills. Angel, just enjoy the lovely walk home and... I hate not knowing things. Kevin laughed. I promise you'll like this surprise. Ainsley was tempted to make another guess, but figured she would keep her mouth shut. When they arrived home, a stranger was standing on their porch, holding a leash attached to an enthusiastic yellow dog. It looked like a lab, but Ainsley couldn't be sure. Paul, it's nice to see you, Kevin said. Paul smiled. I guess this is Ainsley? Yes, I am. Why couldn't this man get moving so she could get her surprise? Ainsley, meet your dog, Clifford. Wait, he's our dog? Ainsley asked, stunned. He is a new addition to the Taylor family. Surprise, Ainsley. She squealed and tossed herself into Kevin's arms. She placed a kiss on his lips, her arms holding him close. He got me a dog. I have a dog. I've always wanted a dog. Ainsley was flattered that he was willing to listen to her. Want to meet your dog? Kevin asked as they pulled apart. Yes! Ainsley squealed. She walked over to Clifford, who was wagging his tail with excitement. She knelt down and patted his head which earned her a lick to the face. Ainsley giggled and began speaking to the dog in baby talk. She didn't notice that the man that delivered Clifford made his excuses and left. Chapter 10 Ainsley hesitated at Kevin's door, her heart nearly pounding out of her chest. She was going to be brave for once and put herself out there. Clifford was napping in his dog bed, which was by her bed. How Kevin was able to sneak the supplies for a pet into her room, she would never know. But his surprise was touching. He actually listened to Ainsley's wants and needs. Now it was time for her to truly let Kevin in. She really wanted to, but she was nervous. What if he said no? What if he was disgusted with her? 
She shook her head and silenced the negativity. For once, Ainsley would go for what she really wanted. She knocked and waited for his voice to reach her. Come in. Finally. Ainsley opened the door and tentatively stepped into the room. Kevin was standing by the door, dressed in nothing but a towel. Her mouth watered. Instead of offering some kind of apology, she stopped herself. This situation would work to her benefit. Ainsley walked over to him and planted a kiss on his plump lips. Her tongue delved into his mouth, and she took control of the kiss, enjoying the taste of his mouth. Kevin held her close, her body pressed against his. She craved his skin, hungering for there to be nothing between them. She pulled away only to take off her nightgown. As soon as their skin touched, the kissing resumed. She allowed herself to drown in Kevin and truly enjoyed the passion between them. Before she knew it, they were in bed their bodies moving together, both of them experiencing a night filled with bliss. Kevin's eyes opened, and he immediately noticed that Ainsley wasn't beside him. His wife was a worrier. He could only imagine all of the doubts that were dancing around in that brain of hers. Last night had been fantastic. He enjoyed making love to Ainsley and hoped that they could have another round. But if she wasn't comfortable with her decision, it would only set them back. He got out of bed and headed into the shower. After changing into a t-shirt, jean shorts, and sneakers, Kevin rushed into the kitchen to see his pretty wife drinking a smoothie. A cup of coffee was waiting for him across from her, along with a toasted bagel. It has peanut butter, your favorite. There went the uneasy expression again. Kevin pressed a kiss to her cheek. Missed you this morning, he said. Ainsley smiled. I had to walk Clifford. Where is the guy? In my room, playing with one of his toys. I'll come back during my lunch break to walk him. Sounds like a plan. Thank you for breakfast. You're welcome. They enjoyed a companionable silence, Kevin's eyes resting on his wife. He wanted to ask her to move into the master bedroom, but didn't want to rush her. But it didn't mean that he didn't want to make the idea enticing. Kevin let out a groan when Greg Adams entered the spa's barber shop, a confident expression on his face. I don't have time for this. I have a customer in two minutes. How can I get rid of him? Kevin mentally asked himself. Greg, I have a client in two minutes. What are you doing here? I had Mike Garcia book my appointment for me, so let's get on with it. On with what? Kevin asked, eyeing the guy's haircut. I want to know why you refuse to forgive me. Why do you care if I do? Greg shuffled his feet. I sort of, uh, um, I have information for you. Information? Kevin could care less what this man had to say. Rumor has it that Stacy's trying to get a job at your spa. I think she wants you back. I married. How would that affect me? Greg groaned. You would seriously turn her down? She's hot. I'm married to someone I care about. Is that hard for you to understand? I mean, I think with work, Ainsley would be hot. But she doesn't put herself together right. She... Kevin couldn't help it. He swung his fist barely missing Greg Adams's face. The idiot moved out of the way and held up his hands in a placating way. 
Damn, I was just speaking my mind. Fine, you're a married man. I won't point out that you could keep Stacy on the side. Why was I ever friends with you? Kevin asked. Because we like sports, good beer, and hot women. That is the basis of all friendships. Is this a therapy session? Tessa asked as she entered the room. No, he signed up to get a haircut, Kevin explained. Tessa frowned. What are you up to, Daniel? It's Greg. Whatever. All seven of you are nothing but trouble. So, what do you want? To be friends with Kevin. I have to make things up to him. Why? Tessa demanded. No reason. We had good times together. He won't tell me either, Kevin told his friend. I came up here to ask if you were interested in a pizza. Thomas offered to bring some over for lunch. Sure am. Can you make sure that you have vegetable pizza? That's Ainsley's favorite. Sure will, Tessa agreed. I love meat lovers, Greg said. He's staying, Tessa complained. He can do what he wants. I can't control him. Kevin replied, resigned to the fact that Greg would only leave when he felt like it. After Ainsley was done checking in a lovely woman who had a hair appointment, Ainsley locked the iPad and hurried to Kevin's barber shop. If Greg was any trouble, she'd help Kevin deal with him. She was about to poke her head in when she heard Greg's words. Rumor has it that Stacy's trying to get a job at your spa. I think she wants you back. Ainsley's heart cracked at the thought that Stacy was actually competition. I'm married. How would that affect me? Kevin's annoyed tone gave her some hope. Greg groaned. You would seriously turn her down? She's hot. I'm married to someone I care about. Is that hard for you to understand? I mean, I think with work, Ainsley would be hot. But she doesn't put herself together right. She... Ainsley ran back to her desk, forcing herself not to cry. She wouldn't stay to hear Kevin say something like, She's kind of on the inside. Who cares about the outside? She didn't want to be reminded that she would never be stunning like Stacy. Is something wrong, Miss Taylor? A man asked. Ainsley blinked and looked up to see Tessa's husband, Thomas Daly, standing there with a smile on his face. You can call me Ainsley, and nothing's wrong. Thomas shook his head. How can anyone help you fix a problem if you refuse to talk about it? Let's see. Stacy wants Kevin back, and you've seen her. Yeah? She's one foul woman. One time, one of the orphans sold her lemonade. I guess it was too tart for her liking. So she poured it out in front of him and demanded a refund. The kid was only six and began crying, but that didn't stop her from harassing the poor kid. I handed Stacy the dollar and told her to move along. After calling me something I refused to repeat, she left. I'm positive you wouldn't have done something like that. Ainsley shuddered at the thought, Of course not! If Stacy wants Kevin back, it's because no other man would take her. Let me tell you something, Ainsley. She's trouble. Everyone keeps telling me that and won't tell me why. Thomas sighed. Ask Kevin. He won't tell me. Maybe he's worried you'll take it badly, Thomas suggested. Do I have a reason to take it badly? I find it best 
to concentrate on the future, Ainsley. Trust me, you shouldn't dwell on what happened in the past. It isn't like you can do anything to change it, unless you have a time machine hidden in your purse somewhere. Ainsley chuckled. Maybe you're right. I just, I don't know. How would you feel if Tessa's ex wanted her back? I wouldn't care. Sonny loves me. If only she could feel that confident in herself. I've got to grab the pizza. Talk to Kevin. After those parting words, Thomas exited the building. Kevin, can we talk about something? Ainsley asked him later that night. Ainsley sat beside him on the couch, a mug of tea in hand. Kevin sipped on a beer while he watched a baseball game. Sure. What went wrong between you and Stacy? I saw her true colors. Damn it, that was a vague answer. Ainsley wanted details. That's not specific, Ainsley complained. She cheated on me with Greg. Which was a bad move. If I were her, I would have chosen you all the way, Ainsley blurted out. Kevin laughed. That's because you're nothing like her. You actually have a soul. Kevin continued watching the game, effectively ending the conversation. Ainsley had a terrible feeling that there was something dark between Kevin and Stacy. She just couldn't figure it out. Why was Stacy trouble? Was it because she came between two friends? Or maybe she did something else to hurt her husband? Chapter 11 On Saturday morning, a kiss to the forehead was what woke Ainsley up. She opened her eyes to see her husband smiling down at her. She sat up and stifled a yawn. It's nice to see you first thing in the morning, Ainsley said. It would even be nicer if you woke up in my bed tomorrow. Ainsley's stomach flipped at the thought. Could she really give up her space and move into Kevin's room? I'll think about it. Kevin cheered. Come on, I have breakfast for us. Ainsley got out of bed and quickly went to the bathroom to complete her morning routine. She joined Kevin in the kitchen and was surprised when the doorbell rang. Clifford, who was drinking from his water bowl, barked. Easy, boy, Ainsley said, petting the dog to calm him. Since Kevin was pouring his coffee, she opened the door to a bright-eyed teenage boy holding a guitar. Hi, I'm Toby. Is Kevin Taylor here? The kid seemed nervous, so Ainsley shot him a reassuring look. Of course he is. Follow me. Toby followed Ainsley into the kitchen. Toby? How have you been? Kevin asked, seeming pleasantly surprised. I'm fine. My aunt got me a summer job singing messages, so let me get this one over with. Toby strummed the melody to saying sorry by a famous pop star she couldn't remember. That was more Pree's thing. It's not too late to say I'm sorry. I screwed you over and I regret it. Please find it in your heart to forgive me. I tried so hard to make things up to you. I don't know what else to do. Toby had a beautiful voice, so Ainsley clapped. Kevin scowled. Did Greg put you up to this? Yes, apparently you like music. Toby, tell him he isn't forgiven. I knew I should have gone for sorry 2004 and changed the date, Toby complained. What usually happens when you sing to people, Ainsley asked. I usually sing love songs. This is only my third apology song. In both cases, the people were much happier than Kevin is right now. Kevin gestured to the chair. Sit, eat, forget about Greg Adams. Luther Vandross himself couldn't have sung our problems away. 
I can't stay long. I have another song to sing. Ainsley handed Toby a bottle of water. Thank you, Miss Taylor. I should be going now. Toby left the house, closing the door behind him. Why does Greg want you to forgive him so badly? Ainsley wondered. Kevin placed a heaping plate of blueberry pancakes in front of her. Who knows? This is weird, even for him. But sending Toby? What's wrong with sending Toby? Nothing. It's just, he's Thomas's nephew. Both of his parents are in prison. We do our best to look out for him. Kevin proceeded to tell Ainsley about Thomas's brother Tripp and sister-in-law Linda's crimes. She felt horribly for Toby. I guess he knew that you would at least listen to Toby, Ainsley figured. I feel bad for the kid. Me too, but he seems happy enough living with his aunt. You're a good man, Kevin, Ainsley said. I try to be and thanks for making a delicious breakfast. She took a sip of her tea, excited that it tasted just how she liked it. Kevin was seriously showing that he cared about her. Until she married Kevin, Presley had been the only person to consider her wants and needs. She vowed to do something special for Kevin, to show him her appreciation. The orphanage resembled a hotel from the outside. Ainsley was nervous when Kevin led her into the lobby. A beautiful blonde sat behind the reception desk, her tired eyes filling with warmth. Welcome, Kevin, Ainsley, she greeted. Hi, Jill, Kevin replied. It's so nice to meet you, Jill. I, uh, I hope my gift is acceptable. I just... Anything helps, Jill assured her. Kevin lifted the crate of books off of the cart he was pushing and set them on the desk. Jill's eyes lit up. I brought all of my favorites growing up. I hope you have a reader among you. Jill smiled wickedly. Oh, don't worry, Ainsley. I think I'll encourage a new pastime for the children. Ainsley sagged in relief, and Kevin led her into the dining hall. They sat at a table with Pre, Sal, Thomas, and Tessa. Hey, sis, this is the work table. We never get a day off around here, Presley brightly warned. It's okay. I'd love to help, Ainsley said, meaning every word. She took a seat beside her twin and rubbed her back. You doing all right, Pre? I need my twin right now. I miss living with you. Ainsley kissed her sister's cheek. We're definitely due for a sleepover. You need to spend quality time with my dog Clifford and me. You have a dog? Presley asked, her eyes lighting up. Yes, he's amazing. Kevin surprised me with Clifford the other night. He's a treasure. I wish I could have a pet. You know how much I like cats, but things are a challenge. It was obvious that Pre wasn't happy. I'll get a phone soon, then you'll have full access to me. Miss Presley, can you make Michael give me back my toy? An adorable five-year-old girl asked. Ainsley smiled down at her. I miss Presley's twin. I miss Ainsley. What's your name? Molly, Michael took my bear. Presley rubbed her forehead. Come on, Molly. Let's talk to Michael about your bear. Her twin took Molly's hand, and they walked over to the little boy that was hiding in the corner. Ainsley's heart filled with worry. Pre was obviously hurting. Ainsley's eyes landed on Sal, who looked like he'd rather be burning at the stake. There was definitely a story there. Presley hurried back a few minutes later with an awkward expression on her face. Um, sis, we have a situation. I have to go find Molly's bear and I can't host the event. Can you step in? 
Ainsley nodded. Sure. Do you have any games planned? Well, um, what had happened was... Uh, give me your phone, Ainsley demanded. Pre fished her phone out of her pocket and handed it to Ainsley. The password's the same. Thank you, sis. Pre rushed off, Molly and Michael following behind her. I'm going to help Presley, Sal said before walking away. Ainsley frantically googled and smiled upon seeing a few results. She got to her feet and eyed Tessa. Where's the kitchen? I'll lead the way. Ainsley stood in the middle of the dining room, her heart racing. The room was filled with strangers who were all waiting for her to speak. Kevin stood at the table with the supplies they would need for the games Ainsley found online. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I think that we can play a few games. I need four participants and four assistants. To Ainsley's annoyance, Stacy and Grace were the first to step forward. Stacy eyed Kevin with interest, but he didn't seem to notice. Greg and Carla, one of the women who worked at the spa, also joined them. The other two teams consisted of four children from the orphanage. Eight chairs were set up into the two rows facing each other. One of the members of your team has to be blindfolded, Ainsley announced. Kevin, you want to help me? Stacy purred. Kevin handed Stacy the blindfold and waved her away. Ainsley was glad to see how he handled things. Carla, on the other hand, frowned at Kevin as if she disapproved of his behavior. Were Carla and Stacy friends? That would be her luck. When the teams were sitting on the chairs, Ainsley spoke. Participants, your assistant will feed you a spoonful of baby food, and you have to guess the flavor. Assistants, raise your hand and I'll come over to you so you can quietly tell me your partner's guess. Whoever guesses the right flavor earns a point. Kevin, hand out the first jar. Moments later, Stacy let out a squeak. Grace, I won't taste that crap. Switch with me. Grace ignored her and shoved some baby food into her mouth. Thomas raised his hand. Ainsley rushed over to him, and he whispered, Apple. Ainsley nodded. That round, Tessa was the only one to guess the correct answer. The next rounds went much the same, with Tessa and Thomas the only ones to score any points. Stacy pouted. That was a stupid game. Come on, baby food flavors. Ainsley, can you come up with something else? If you didn't like the game, Miss Williams, you could just leave, Thomas suggested. Stacy blushed when the children started chanting. Leave, 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 leave. leave. Stacy stood flung her blindfold at the floor and stormed out of the room. After Jill reprimanded the children for their behavior, Ainsley started a game of musical chairs, which a ten-year-old ended up winning. Thankfully, the pizza delivery came, which put a temporary end to the games. Ainsley joined her friends and husband and happily ate pizza. Chapter 12 the next day, Ainsley wandered into Kevin's bedroom. The stringing of cords piqued her curiosity. She stood near the doorway and watched Kevin, who was playing his acoustic guitar. She smiled to herself when he began singing a pop song she secretly sang in the shower. It was a duet, something she pictured herself singing with an imaginary boyfriend it was funny how, even when she was with Patrick, she oftentimes fantasized about having a boyfriend. And yet, those thoughts never crossed her mind during her marriage to Kevin. He was great and allowed her to feel free. 
Without hesitation, Ainsley walked further into the room and began singing the second verse of the love song with gusto. When Kevin's eyes locked with hers, the love song spoke to her soul. It was like the composer knew that she would fall in love some day. Their voices sounded beautiful during the chorus, the moment bringing her so much joy. When the song ended, Kevin whistled. You have a beautiful voice, Ainsley. We'll wow them. Want to enter couples karaoke? I'd love to, Ainsley exclaimed. When is it? Next month. They usually do a tournament. With your powerhouse vocals, our team has a huge chance of winning. Ainsley grinned. Patrick said that my voice was mediocre at best. Kevin gently put his guitar back in the case and shoved the case under the bed. Then he stood and stalked toward Ainsley, his eyes holding determination. What did Presley say about your singing? She said that it was good, but she has to say that sort of thing. She's my twin. Kevin's face grew close to Ainsley's his breath hitting her lips. You're quick to believe your ex and not your husband or your twin. Why is that, Angel? I don't know, Ainsley squeaked out. His arms wrapped around her, his lips grazing her cheek. You're beautiful, talented, generous, and so many other things. Believe me, before she could even answer, Kevin pressed his lips against hers. She was consumed by passion, her arms pulling him close, their kisses intensified, his tongue surging into her mouth. The passion nearly split Ainsley in half. They went from kissing to pulling at each other's clothes. Then Ainsley found herself in bed, doing a sensual dance with the husband she was falling in love with. Ainsley groaned the next morning, her eyelids not wanting to open. Kevin's side of the bed was empty, which was a surprise. She usually woke up before he did. She rolled out of his bed and snatched up her loungewear from the floor, not feeling bold enough to walk around naked. Flashbacks of their night together made her blush. Kevin was attentive in every way, and she ignored the tiny voice warning that he could leave. She believed Kevin. Hell, she was pretty sure she loved him, and she couldn't wait to see him. Ainsley rushed to her room, took a shower, and changed into a blouse and skirt. She seriously needed to go shopping to increase her collection of summer clothing. She no longer had the benefit of driving to work. After putting her hair into a ponytail and brushing gloss on her lips, Ainsley hurried into the kitchen. Kevin greeted her with a kiss on the lips. Good morning, Angel, he greeted. Morning. If I don't hurry, I'll be late, Ainsley cried, spotting a cup of tea and a scone set out. Thanks for breakfast. My pleasure. I got something for you. Really? Ainsley's heart sped up, hope flickering to life. Did he purchase a wedding ring for her? Kevin picked up a familiar-looking box up from the seat that concealed it. I should have gotten a phone for you sooner. Disappointment flooded Ainsley's stomach, but that was quickly replaced by gratitude. Kevin, thank you, Ainsley squealed, giving him a tight hug. I'll set this up for you while you eat, Kevin said. Ainsley nodded and sat at the table. She should seriously do something special for Kevin once she had enough money. A light bulb went off in her head. She could start making plans on his wedding band. With that idea in mind, Ainsley started eating her breakfast. Kevin smiled when he saw Ainsley sitting at the reception desk. He wanted to kiss her, 
but since there was a customer sitting in one of the chairs, he held back. She smiled and handed him a paper bag. I went to this dog-friendly cafe during lunch and got you a sandwich. Thanks, Angel, Kevin said, happy that he didn't have to choke down a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Before he could take his lunch into the break room, the door opened and his uncle councilman, Ben Taylor, entered. Uncle Ben, what brings you here? Kevin hadn't spoken to the man in two years. They weren't at odds. They just ran in different circles. Councilman Taylor grinned. Can we talk somewhere private? Okay, Kevin said. He grabbed the paper bag and smiled at Ainsley. Uncle, this is my wife. Ainsley, I know. I don't have much time. I need you to come with me. He led his uncle into the break room, and once the door closed, the man let out a sigh. <sighs> I wanted to ask you about the mail order bride process. Kevin frowned. Why? Are you and Aunt Deidre having problems? No, it's for Tyson. Kevin was shocked to hear that his cousin was interested in sending for a bride. The man valued solitude above everything else. They texted once in a while, but Kevin couldn't remember the last time he saw Tyson in person. He might be. How does the process work? Cassandra views the groom, then, Did you get to choose your wife from a catalog? No, she matches people based on personality. That might not work. Tyson's very particular. He likes quiet women. Uncle Ben, what is this really about? Kevin asked, a terrible feeling filling his gut. Are you happy with your bride? Yes. He might even love Ainsley, but he didn't want to tell his uncle that. Thank you, Kevin. You gave me useful information, Uncle Ben said before leaving the room. Tyson was screwed. His cousin was going to receive an ultimatum. Kevin was sure of it. Do you have food? Tessa asked after walking into the room. Kevin sighed. You forgot to pack your lunch again? Yeah, I stupidly told Tom that he didn't have to pack my lunch last night. He was going to get out of bed to do it, but I... Have some of my food, Kevin said, just to get some peace. Tessa smirked. What was your uncle doing here? Kevin opened the bag and revealed two sandwiches, one bag of chips, and a piece of carrot cake. He pulled a note out of the bag. Kevin, I got you two sandwiches in case Tessa wanted one. A. Kevin grinned, tossed Tessa a sandwich, and began eating. Two hours to go, Ainsley told herself, as she fidgeted with her new phone. She was still shocked that Kevin got her one. The day was dragging, and she really needed entertainment, so she logged onto Facebook. She checked her notifications and saw it on top. Shelley had tagged her in a post. She clicked on the post and read it to herself. After six months of dating, Patrick and I decided to take the next step. We're engaged. Ainsley waited for the pain to hit her, but it never came. Patrick wanted someone else. She never was the one for him. It took being with Kevin to realize that she liked someone that radiated kindness, not self-importance. She wasn't enough for Patrick, and that part of her hurt. But she didn't envy Shelley's position. She not only liked the post, she commented on it. Congratulations! I wish you nothing but happiness. She closed the Facebook app, having no desire to look through social media. Running footsteps caught her attention. Ainsley looked up to see a frantic Carla heading in her direction. Cancel all my appointments. I have an emergency, she shouted before running out the door.
Ainsley sighed and called Carla's clients and rescheduled their appointments. That night, Ainsley laid in bed, flipping through channels, and she settled for an episode of a crime documentary series she liked. Her door opened and Kevin entered, dressed in nothing but boxers. She scooted to the left, and he slid in, his presence making her sigh in contentment. She snuggled into him. Crime before bed? Kevin asked. Yep. Won't you have nightmares? Not with you holding me, Ainsley replied, her body relaxing. Clifford was in his dog bed, settled down for the night. She had a perfect family. She just hoped that Kevin wanted forever with her. After all, Stacy was interested in him. Would he give in to the temptation or honor his wedding vows? Chapter 13 The heat blasted Ainsley when she led Clifford out of the house. She smiled down at the dog who was wagging his tail. This was the best part of her workday, apart from seeing Kevin. On Portham Island, businesses were dog-friendly. She allowed the dog to water the lawn and pick up his present and tossed it into the trash can. All right, Clifford, let's go get some lunch, Ainsley said. She walked down the street and smiled at the other pedestrians. She was having a pleasant week, her insecurities slowly slipping away. In fact, she was thinking that it was time to begin sharing space with Kevin. Maybe she would broach the subject with him sometime tonight. At that moment, she noticed a jewelry store on the corner. She was confident that she could pick out a wedding band for him. She smiled, anticipation filling her at the thought of him wearing something that symbolized that he belonged to her. The good mood vanished when she saw Stacy walking out of the jewelry store, followed by a defeated-looking Carla. Tears were streaming down the spa employee's face. Ainsley frowned, trying to decide what to do. It wasn't like she and Carla were friends, but could she really leave a vulnerable person in Stacy's clutches? Ainsley forced herself to cross the street and join the two women. Carla, is everything okay? Ainsley asked. Carla rubbed her face. It's fine. Stacy solved one of my problems. Ainsley eyed Stacy, who looked as if she just won Miss Universe. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you were all right, Ainsley awkwardly said. You should go get your lunch, Carla insisted. Stacy's eyes lit up. Ainsley, I'm glad you're here. In fact, I have useful information for you. What would that be? Ainsley knew something bad was coming when Carla shot her a horrified look. I just sold Kevin's wedding band. After the divorce, he was nice enough to allow me to take his ring. He was so broken up about the divorce, he couldn't touch the thing. Divorce? Ainsley couldn't speak, and Clifford, probably sensing her anxiety, began to whine. Kevin didn't tell you? That must be because he can't bear to talk about me, Stacy said, the idea obviously giving her pleasure. You were married to Kevin? Ainsley couldn't process the words she was hearing. Kevin was married to Stacy and didn't think that this information was important? The ring's in there, Stacy said, gesturing at the jewelry store. Ainsley would never see the evidence that Kevin once belonged to this hideous creature. Instead, she turned around and took the dog home, not even bothering to grab lunch at the diner. Instead, she collapsed on the couch and cried. Kevin, we need to talk, Carla said, her face filled with excitement. Kevin was standing in the doorway of the break room, eager to visit Ainsley at the reception desk before his next appointment. Ainsley wanted to try out a diner for lunch, and he hoped that she had a wonderful time with Clifford. But he obviously needed to deal with Carla. 
duty calls. Sure, what's going on, Carla? Carla smiled. I'm getting married. Congratulations. When is this wedding? In two months, Jason Blackhawk proposed. And you know how that is. Kevin's heart sank. When do you have to stop working? Mary wants me to stop working now, but I can finish the rest of the day. This was a disaster. What in the hell were they going to do? It was difficult enough finding Carla. How were they going to honor the appointments? I have a friend that will fill in for me until someone gets certified. Really? That's great. Who? My friend Stacy. Kevin wanted to shout, Hell no! But he was smarter than that. He took a deep breath and thought with a business brain. I'll talk to the girls. Ainsley didn't see Kevin until it was time to leave, and she was glad for it. She stashed the iPad in her messenger bag and walked towards her husband. His expression was strained, which was confusing. After all, she was the one who found out that her husband had an ex-wife. She was the one who was lied to. At least he knew all of the skeletons in her closet. But he wasn't willing to share that Stacy was his ex-wife. Carla quit today, Kevin announced. Did you find a replacement? Ainsley tried to keep her anger down, since Esperanza and Tessa were by the exit. We hired Stacy. It's temporary until we can find someone else. You hired your ex-wife to work here? Ainsley hissed. Kevin's shoulders sagged. I hired the one that was capable of doing the job. Our relationship has nothing to do with it. How could you do this to me? To you? This is the best decision for the business. This isn't about you. You lied to me. You never told me that you were married to Stacy, and now I have to work with her? You don't have to work, Ainsley, Kevin said. And you don't want me here? I knew it. Fine. I won't work then. Ainsley ran out of the spa, humiliation and anger stirring within her. Tears fell, preventing her from seeing her whereabouts. Twin! What happened? Pre asked, her arms wrapping around her. Ainsley clutched Presley close to her and began to weep. Presley held her, her presence soothing the ache in her soul. Ain, calm down. Don't cry. Let's grab a drink so we can talk about things. It took effort, but Ainsley forced the tears back and allowed Presley to lead her into the diner that was halfway down the block. A cheery hostess led them to the table in the back and left them with menus. Ainsley collapsed into the seat across from Presley. Her twin shot her a tentative smile. What happened? she asked. Kevin used to be married to Stacy, and everyone knew it. I can't believe he didn't tell me. Why keep this from me? He was probably embarrassed, Ain. Think about it. Stacy's nothing more than a shallow, hateful broad without a heart, and Kevin was stupid enough to put a ring on it. Or he still loves her. Who could love someone so foul? You saw her at Esperanza's baby shower. The waitress walked over. My name is Tina, and I'll be taking care of you. What would you like to drink? We would love two waters, one hamburger with a side salad, and a cheeseburger with a baked potato on the side. Oh, and please put two apple pies with a side of ice cream for dessert. The waitress smiled at Presley before walking away. I can't believe he lied to me. Why did he keep on answering my question with, She's trouble. How about she's my ex-wife? Ainsley asked. Maybe Kevin didn't want to lose you, Pre suggested. Ainsley shook her head. He wants his ex-wife back. It's obvious by how he's willing to fire me. You should have heard him. He said I didn't have to work. I don't think he meant it that way, Ain. The guy's crazy about you. Patrick never looked at you the way Kevin does. 
Kevin has a type. I'm telling you, Pre. His type is stunning. Then you fit the mold perfectly, Ain. I'm a book-loving nerd. He likes women like you. You know what to do with your hair and makeup, and you can coordinate an outfit. Yeah, because those things are useful in an orphanage, Pre snorted. Of course those things are important, Pre. You're in an orphanage filled with women. I'd bet you can do something with them, like a sewing class. I, on the other hand, can only hold a book club for them. Only? Ain, that's your problem. A kid's book club would be great. After we meet for our book club next week, you could propose one to Jill. She'll go for it, trust me. The waitress delivered the drinks and food to the table. After she left, the conversation continued. How's married life for you? Ainsley asked her sister. Fine, sounds serious, but I'm going to force him to lighten up. Enough about me, this is about you. Twin, you're struggling. I saw you at the party, Ainsley insisted. Everything will work itself out, Pree said, before digging into her food. That was her twin's way of not answering. Ainsley was worried about Presley and wanted to help in any way. If that meant volunteering at the orphanage, then she would be more than happy to do so. Maybe she would propose the book club to Jill. That would give Presley and Sal some time alone. Chapter 14 You're an idiot, Tessa told Kevin as soon as Ainsley ran out of the spa. Kevin groaned. Which one of you told her that I was married to Stacy? Clearly not you. Esperanza plopped down in one of the chairs designated for waiting guests. To be honest, none of us said a word. It was probably Stacy. Kevin despised the fact that his ex-wife always managed to ruin his life. I wanted to wait to tell her. Ainsley is unsure of herself. I didn't want her to doubt how much I care for her. If Kevin was being honest, he was falling in love with Ainsley. Tessa covered her face. Guys are stupid. I'll swear. Some of them have no common sense. Why not just tell the truth? I'm so glad I married Thomas. At least he tells me what he's thinking. Tessa. You aren't helping, Esperanza gently told her. Kevin, you need to assure Ainsley that she's the only woman you want to be with. She should already know that. I married her. Kevin knew he was wrong for hiding the truth from his wife, but their married life was a dream, something that was filled with laughter, excitement, and love. He hadn't wanted to cause problems between them. He should have known that Stacy would try to ruin things for him. Hell, she caused trouble at Esperanza's baby shower. He should have known better. I know women well. She needs to vent to her sister, Kevin said. Tessa and Esperanza nodded. I wouldn't want to see Asher if he had a secret ex-wife in his past. Asher entered the spa with Thomas at that very moment, his eyes lighting up when he saw his wife. Hi, sweetheart. How are you feeling? The councilman asked his wife. Exhausted, but it looks like we'll have to send someone to the mainland for school. I need another aesthetician, Carla Quit. Allison Quit as well. I wonder if the pair quitting is connected, Thomas said. Tessa groaned. No more drama. I don't want someone else trying to sabotage us. Do you guys think Emma's still causing trouble? Probably not. From what Toby said, she's been in seclusion, Thomas replied. 
and your brother and his ex-wife are still in prison. Kevin, do you think Stacy wants to see us fail? I don't think so. She left me and took my money with her. I was the wronged party. That doesn't always matter, Tessa said. Take Emma, for example. She nagged me so badly I blew up at her, Esperanza pointed out. Kevin shrugged. I'll ask her tomorrow. You're going to speak to Miss Williams? Thomas asked, puzzled. Her name is Stacy, Tom. Say it with me. Stacy, Tessa snapped. Leave him be, Tessa. Tessa's response elicited a sigh from Esperanza. Tessa, you can nag Thomas for a century, and he'll continue calling people he's uncomfortable with by their last names. So stop, please, Esperanza begged. Nope. As interesting as this is, I've got to feed Clifford. I have the feeling that my wife isn't coming home any time soon. Kevin exited the spa, unenthusiastic about going home. He didn't want to face an empty house without Ainsley. He slowly walked home and was surprised to see Sal pacing in front of his house. Have you heard from Presley? His best friend demanded. She's at dinner with my wife. Why? She's leaving, Kevin. She isn't happy here and she wants out. What makes you think that? Kevin asked skeptically. Presley wasn't about to leave her sister behind. That was for sure. Those two were extremely close. It doesn't matter how I know. What restaurant are they at? I saw Presley lead her to the diner down the street from the spa. His best friend looked like he was about to run into her. But Kevin held up a hand. Ainsley's upset right now. Presley isn't going to leave her. Why don't you... Sal ran off, his desperation obviously not allowing him to see reason. Kevin entered his dark and lonely house, hating that his wife was nowhere in sight. His cell phone rang as he was pouring dog food in Clifford's bowl. The lab ran to the bowl and excitedly gobbled up the food. Kevin answered the call, hoping it was Ainsley. Kevin? I just wanted to check in. Since you can't be bothered to call your mother. Mom, now isn't a good time. Kevin forced through his tight throat. He didn't want to tell his mother about the epic screw-up. She would probably have Tessa's reaction. Oh, don't start with the oh, I'm a grown man crap and tell me what's going on. Stacy told Ainsley about our divorce. You didn't tell Cassandra to include that on her dossier about you? Mom, it's not like a sperm bank. I don't think women get to choose their husbands from a profile. Cassandra makes the matches. Clifford finished his meal and Kevin leashed the dog, grabbed a dog bag, and took him outside. Well, that's stupid. Why did Ainsley become a mail-order bride? Presley got her fired by starting a fistfight with the woman that stole Ainsley's boyfriend. And why didn't you tell your wife about that snake? Because I didn't think Stacy was important. She was nothing but a headache for me. I just wanted to keep her firmly in the past. Now, imagine how your wife feels. She opened up to you, even told you about her relationships. But you could let her in. Kevin. This woman you're with isn't one of those shallow women you used to date. She's someone who wants an emotional connection. She trusted you to be vulnerable. Now, go make things right with your woman. Give her your heart and trust her with your secret. I can tell she's a lovely young lady. I will, Kevin said his mother's words touching his heart. 
He'd do his best to bear it all to Ainsley, if she allowed him to. Ainsley slowly entered her house, her ears straining to hear sound. It was barely nine o'clock, which meant that running into Kevin would be a high likelihood. She wouldn't speak to him if she could help it. She quietly closed the door and was about to escape to her room, but then the light flickered on, causing Ainsley to let out a surprised shout. Sneaking in? Kevin asked, his expression tired. Do you blame me? Do you blame me? Stacy told me that you were once married to her. Stacy, not you. I told you all of my embarrassing secrets, and you didn't even open up to me in the same way. I feel like a fool, since everyone knew something important about you. I feel... I, I feel cheated, Ainsley. I didn't think that you were ready to hear about our past. You mean you didn't want to tell me? Then you fired me, Ainsley screeched. Fired you? Kevin's confusion made her temples throb. Yes, you told me I didn't have to work anymore. You, Kevin pulled Ainsley into his arms, her face pressing against his t-shirt. That's not what I meant, Angel. I meant that you could avoid Stacy until we found an aesthetician to replace her. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. I care about you. Stacy's your ex-wife, and you didn't tell me, Ainsley squeaked out, because I didn't want to get into it. Stacy's trouble. She's a snake, and I don't trust her. I can tell you all about what happened. Okay, Ainsley said, her throat aching from forcing words out. She didn't want to hear about their love match and how she was the one that got away but she forced herself to pull away from Kevin and walked into the living room. She plopped down on the couch, and Kevin sat beside her, his leg pressed up against hers. He held her hand and let out a breath. <sighs> Our story started five years ago. I was single, bored, and lonely. I think that's how Stacy hooked me in. Back then... She was an aesthetician that worked on the faces of the wealthy. I admired a businesswoman. We dated, fell in love, got married, and I thought everything was perfect. That was until I came home one day and found my wife's things and my jewelry missing. I found a note on the bed that said, I want to be with Greg. I want a divorce. I couldn't believe her note, since Greg was my best friend. So, like a fool, I went over to his place and rang the bell. When Stacy opened the door, dressed in a robe, I got the hint. It wasn't until I recovered from my depression that I realized that she cleaned me out. She told me that the money was gone, so I could forget about it. She squandered everything I worked for. She played me like a fool, and I was embarrassed about everything. That's why I didn't tell you. Ainsley braced herself for a negative answer to her question. Do you still love her? <sighs> Hell no. Good, Ainsley said before straddling Kevin's lap and placing a hot kiss to his lips. She believed every word he said and wanted to bask in his love and acceptance. He held her close, his hands rubbing her back. I'm sorry, Angel, Kevin softly told her when their lips separated. I forgive you, Ainsley said before kissing him again. Chapter 15 Hi, Ainsley, Carla greeted, a nervous expression on her face. I'm here for a facial. Ainsley eyed Carla, who was dressed in a pink sundress and strappy sandals. Her black hair was up in a ponytail. There were circles under her brown eyes. For a newly engaged woman, she sure was missing the glow. Carla, it's nice to see you again, Ainsley said before signing her in. 
Thanks, Carla said. Stacy will come get you in five minutes, Ainsley said. The nervous-looking woman quickly grabbed a seat. Something wasn't right about her. Ainsley shrugged thinking that Carla's strange behavior was the least of her worries. Thankfully, Esperanza told Stacy to come in an hour earlier than Ainsley so she could show her around. That meant that Ainsley had minimal contact with Kevin's ex-wife. Stacy strolled in the reception area, a blonde following behind her. The friendly woman waved before rushing out the door. Carla glared at Ainsley, then whispered something to Stacy. Stacy laughed. Then the two women went through the door that led to the hallway. Ainsley checked in the next customer, trying to push Stacy from her mind. Kevin didn't love her anymore. Ainsley was certain about that. The only question plaguing her was, Does Kevin love me? If only Ainsley could be brave enough to ask him. The phone on her desk rang, interrupting her thoughts. LDT Spa, this is Ainsley speaking. How can I help you? Ainsley, I need your help. Please come to the facial room immediately, Stacy demanded. Thinking that something terrible was happening, Ainsley hung up the phone, grabbed her cell phone, and shoved her iPad into her messenger bag before running down the hallway. Hopefully, Carla wasn't having a medical emergency. Ainsley ran down the hallway and burst into the room to find three people standing in front of her. She recognized Carla and Stacy, but the third person was unfamiliar. He was a tall man with tan skin, dark hair, and bulging muscles. What's the emergency? Ainsley squeaked out, her body beginning to sweat. And over the bag, Ainsley. If you do what I say, I won't hurt you too badly, the stranger ordered. Ainsley backed toward the door, hoping that she could escape. But Stacy leapt forward and grabbed her arm. Listen, brat, give me the bag. Our boat leaves in an hour. You're holding us up. Boat? Carla shook her head. If you don't give us the bag, our guy will kill Kevin. Kevin? What the hell was she supposed to do? Client information was stashed in the network, and she forgot to log off. But she couldn't allow Kevin to get hurt. Ainsley opened her mouth, prepared to scream, but Stacy covered her mouth, and the tall man pulled a blade from his pocket and sliced the strap of her messenger bag, cutting Ainsley's skin in the process. The three of them forced Ainsley into a chair and duct-taped her arms and legs to it. Then Ainsley felt pain slam into her head, and she saw nothing but darkness. Greg Taylor walked into the LTD spa, his mother Diana in tow. She was due for a massage, and Greg figured that he could accompany her. Despite not meeting the deadline, he still wanted to earn Kevin's forgiveness. He was surprised when he didn't see Ainsley behind the desk. Did she take a bathroom break? It's unprofessional to leave customers waiting, Diana Adams huffed. Something's not right, Greg said, his heart rate picking up. He eyed the desk, trying to figure out what bothered him. If Ainsley's on a bathroom break, where's the stuff? Who knows? Maybe she took off, Diana guessed, when the door opened and Tessa walked out, followed by Esperanza. They both frowned when they saw the empty desk. Moments later, a couple walked through the door. Where's Ainsley? Esperanza asked. Obviously in the bathroom, Greg's mother replied. No, I was just in there. Has anyone seen Ainsley? Tessa shouted. Everyone shook their heads. Tessa cursed, then ran back down the hallway. Greg decided to follow her. Tessa nearly collided with Kevin. Where's Ainsley? Kevin frowned. She's supposed to be at the front desk. She isn't there. Move it. 
Maybe she's in a corner crying somewhere. I bet Stacy said something mean to her. Kevin's heart ached at the thought that Ainsley was hiding somewhere crying. Stacy was a witch. He never should have agreed to hiring her. Kevin didn't care if all facials needed to be canceled. He wasn't going to put Ainsley through any more hurt. He stormed into Stacy's room, determined to fire his ex-wife, and froze. His wife was duct-taped to the chair, her head lolling to the side. Call an ambulance. She's hurt. Kevin shouted. Before he could touch his wife, a hand snaked out. Don't! You'll ruin the evidence, Greg said, dragging Kevin from the room. Whose room was this? Greg shouted. Kevin didn't care. He wanted to make sure that his wife was all right. Stacy's? Why? Tessa asked. Tessa, this isn't a place for a pregnant woman. Call the police and ambulance. I think someone robbed Ainsley. Kevin stopped fighting because there was no use. Greg was obviously not going to let him go. Let me go. I won't touch anything. Kevin forced out. Greg let him go, and Kevin had to fight the urge to go to her, but he didn't want to hurt her more. Five minutes later, two of the Portham Island's policemen rushed into the hallway, followed by two men pushing a gurney. Kevin sucked in air as they entered the room designated for facials. He wanted to follow, but Greg shook his head. You'll only get in the way, Kevin. Why are you here? Kevin snapped, not trusting Greg's motives. Greg rubbed his face. Kevin! I've been trying to earn your forgiveness this entire time. Nothing more. Why? Kevin demanded. My mother. She sat us boys down and gave us an ultimatum. She told us that she's disappointed in us. She said that out of her seven boys, only Lester and Joe managed to redeem themselves and find nice women. She told the five of us that if we didn't get the person of her choice to forgive us, we would be required to send for a male or a bride. If we refused, we'd be disinherited and sent to the mainland to make our way. Kevin shook his head, inviting me to poker. If you went, I would have passed Mom's test. When is your bride coming? Kevin asked, not in the least bit sorry. It was about time Diana Adams put her foot down. The Adams boys had been a terror for long enough. Greg winced. I'm not sure. I went to Cassandra yesterday. Hopefully she gives me someone hot. Hopefully she gives you someone as wonderful as Ainsley, Kevin said and he meant it. He believed that his former friend was empty inside. Maybe the right woman would make him a better man. All thoughts of Kevin vanished when Ainsley was wheeled out of the room. Thanks to the power of the barrier, the cut on her arm was almost healed. She blinked her eyes open, horror filling her eyes. She sat up and clutched her head. Stacy, Carla... And that stranger stole my bag with all of the client information. You need to get them. You, Kevin, put a hand on his wife's arm. It's okay, Angel. The police will find them, Kevin assured. Not that he cared. He was thrilled to see his wife was sitting up and speaking. He kissed her on the cheek. I'm so glad you're all right, Angel. I love you. Ainsley's eyes lit up. I love you too, Ainsley said. Then one of the paramedics coaxed Ainsley to lay down, and he wheeled her out of the spa. Kevin followed them down a couple of blocks. He was relieved once they reached the clinic. The door opened and a nurse ushered everyone in. Kevin sat in the waiting room and waited for Ainsley to be discharged to go home. 
Two hours later, Ainsley stumbled into the waiting room. Her head still hurt like crap, but she was assured that the pain would go away in a day or two. At least she didn't have a concussion. She could sleep without interruptions. Kevin pulled her into his arms and held her close. Ainsley squeezed him tightly, relieved that those monsters hadn't harmed her husband in any way. She glanced up at her husband and smiled. I love you, Kevin. I love you too, Angel. Chapter 16 Three weeks later, Ainsley stood in her backyard facing Kevin. Thomas Daly, who had gotten himself ordained online, was kind enough to preside over the second wedding. Ainsley wore a blue sundress and flaps, while Kevin opted for a button-down and khaki shorts. Presley, Sal, Kevin's parents, Liz, Marcus, Asher, Esperanza, and Tessa were in attendance. Kendrick and Julia were helping out in the orphanage. Thomas pretty much got to the point, reading the traditional vows. I do, Kevin said before pulling a beautiful engagement ring with a diamond surrounded by five smaller diamonds. Both the engagement ring and the wedding band were gold. When he slipped the beautiful rings on Ainsley's finger, tears filled her eyes. Ainsley, do you take Kevin to be your husband? Thomas asked. I do, Ainsley said, Presley handing her Kevin's rings, since she didn't have pockets. She gently slid the ring on Kevin's finger. It was a solid gold band that had forever engraved on it. I pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the broid. Kevin pulled Ainsley into his arms and kissed her with so much passion that she felt her cheeks burning. All right, fellas. Start grilling while us ladies have book club, Kevin's mother Anna ordered. I need to make an escape before my wife assigns a task for me, Kevin's father Roy declared. If I don't tell you what to do, you don't get anything done, Anna argued. Book club sounds good, Ainsley proclaimed. She gave Kevin one more kiss and rushed into the house to escape the madness, her friends following behind her. Ainsley plopped down on the couch beside her twin. She wrapped an arm around her shoulders. Esperanza, Liz, Julia, and Kevin's mom all took their seats. Anyone read the book? Tessa asked. Child, everyone read the book besides you, Anna replied. Tessa shrugged. I tried to read this one. You see, Thomas distracted me with... Before we get into the book, I heard a piece of gossip, Presley said. What gossip? Ainsley asked her twin. I happen to know an officer. He told me everything. Apparently, Carla and Vince Draper were criminals. Their goal was to steal your iPad and have one of their friends from the mainland hack into it and steal credit card information. But they didn't get very far. Apparently, they were apprehended by female triplets who were ex-military, and they were dragged to prison, where they will stay. The council doesn't trust those three, so they will never be permitted to leave the island. Oh, and Emma, Stacy's sister, was in on it, so she's in prison. Carla's fiancé was innocent and broke off their engagement. I guess Mary Blackhawk played a minor role, so she's also facing consequences. At that news, Liz cheered. Tessa, I got justice. That evil witch is going to spend time in prison, Liz screeched. Tessa smiled. 
She deserves to rot in the slammer. Anyone shocked that Grace wanted to be our aesthetician? I misjudged her. She's actually not bad, Ainsley forced herself to say. Now, let's get to the book, ladies. Epilogue Ten Years Later Mom, I want pancakes for dinner, Ainsley's youngest Jake shouted. Ainsley rushed to the kitchen and saw her four-year-old troublemaker standing on a chair that was pushed against the stove, a box of pancake batter in his grip. Ainsley scooped her boy into her arms. Thankfully, the box of batter hadn't been opened yet. Jake, what did I tell you about trying to cook? She asked her son. I can't cook without you here, so I called you this time. He looked up at her with Kevin's dark brown eyes. Nice try, handsome. You will go into time out for this, Ainsley said, walking into the living room. No time out, Mommy, Jake begged. But Ainsley ignored him and placed him in the corner. She took the box of pancake mix from him and sat on the couch. Ainsley picked up her phone, which she had abandoned on the couch, and opened the text message. Your son is in trouble. <coughs> Glad to hear it. When are you and Haley getting home? <coughs> A couple of minutes. Ainsley smiled at the thought that she had the family she always dreamed of. Haley, her oldest, was eight, and as girly as her Aunt Presley. One of Haley's favorite people was Julia and Kendrick's daughter, Layla. She looked up to the older girl, and thankfully Layla didn't mind. Jake, we're home! Haley shouted. Jake screeched in excitement and ran to his older sister and wrapped her in a hug. Ainsley's heart warmed at their closeness. It reminded her of the bond she shared with Presley. Our parents want to come over for dinner, Kevin announced. Pancakes! Jake screamed. Pancakes are for breakfast, Jake, Haley told her brother. To Ainsley's surprise, her parents willingly moved to Portham Island nearly a decade ago. It was touch and go for a while, but she learned to forgive them. They were excellent grandparents to her kids, which was important. Jake, I'll make you pancakes on Saturday, Ainsley said, knowing that she wouldn't be able to make him anything for breakfast on a weekday. She was the librarian, after all. Nothing was better than a life filled with family, love, laughter, and books. The End This has been Ainsley, Bride's Dock on Portham Island, Book 5 Written by Debbie Civil Narrated by Ishkia Page